Oh, hello. My apologies for the delay. Welcome to our afternoon live here on YouTube. Again, my apologies for the delay. Crazy times we've got going on here. Happy to be here. Happy to join you all here on YouTube live. What a lovely day. What a lovely afternoon. So much to talk about. Oh my goodness. So much to talk about today. Uh, let me just get into the mode where I can see what all of you have to say. I want to see your comments. I want to get everything set up here. This driver software, this encoder software that YouTube has is very, very annoying. I'll tell you that much. It's quite annoying stuff. Quite annoying, but I'm glad to be here on YouTube Live. Um, so why don't, uh, why don't we get going here? I'll send a tweet that, uh, that we have finally begun, and then we can begin. Crazy, crazy afternoon. This encoding software is getting on my nerves, I'll tell you that much. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. What is happening in the world today? Now, I've got plenty to talk about with you folks, plenty to talk about. So, have you noticed, now people will have noticed that going all around social media uh, is this exchange, this argument that, uh, that Joy Behar and uh, this McCain woman had on social media, or it was not on social media, it was on mainstream media, uh, that they had about socialism, about Ocasio-Cortez. People will see that argument. Joy Behar is kind of defending what she thinks is socialism. Just a second, I'm sending out a tweet to announce we've finally gotten started here. So, folks will remember this incident. Um, shout out to History of Socialism. He says hello. Uh, shout out to Raven Dawnhead. Uh, they say hi. Um, what else is happening here? Uh, hey, Caleb, uh, anyone here? Facebook lost 20% of its value, says Tim. That is absolutely true, and that is absolutely fascinating to me, uh, that Facebook has been under all kinds of pressure. They've been blaming them for the election results. How dare they not censor RT? How they, dare they allow different voices out there? How dare they allow different perspectives? And lo and behold, Facebook is complying with their algorithms. Uh, they're cracking down. Actually, someone posted the Declaration of Independence, and it was removed because it contains racist language. Um, you know, they've got all kinds of algorithms now on Facebook to make sure that, dis, uh, that opinions they don't like don't get circulated. But lo and behold, um, that took place, and what happened then? Uh, now, Facebook is losing stock value. People just don't like it as much because the, the thrill of social media was the widespread access to information. You went on social media, you got access to views you don't normally hear, you got to hear different perspectives. Well, lo and behold, uh, now that Facebook is messing with their algorithms, is, is politically controlling things, um, at this point, uh, now Facebook just doesn't have the thrill that it once had. And I could say the same, you know, social media, the lure, the attraction of social media is its ability to show you different sides of the things, is, is to show you different perspectives, be a different uh, different perspective. You can see more things. Well, lo and behold, uh, now that social media is cracking down, it doesn't have that same appeal. Um, you know, I will say that YouTube, the, the platform that we're on here now, they're great, but this driver software they've got has been getting on my nerves. That's why we ended up starting seven minutes late today, as the Wirecast kept, uh, kept giving me the watermark even though I paid for the thing. Very, very annoying. I paid I, I, and all of that and kept giving me the wire mark as if I hadn't paid. A really, really annoying policy. Finally, I just started up and it works, you know? It's very, very annoying. You're about to have a live. You know people are waiting to see your live. But we're live now. The conversation has started, so have no fear. We are officially live, so please tweet out this conversation. Let people know to join it. We've got a lot to talk about today. So the point that I was getting at at the beginning, we were talking about Joy Behar and The View and their little argument about socialism and Michelle McCain or Megan McCain or whatever her name is. And Joy Behar got into it in a conversation about Ocasio-Cortez and socialism. And basically, uh, uh, this right winger starts yelling about how, uh, you know, this will turn the United States into Venezuela. Joy Behar, on the other hand, is saying, oh, look, you know, Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, uh, these different countries have socialist programs and they're not completely bankrupt. 
And that's the terms of the debate that we're having at this moment. Uh, it's basically uh, Scandinavia uh, versus uh, free market neoliberalism, and that's, that's your choices. But I'm somebody who's actually been to Venezuela, and I, I think that the entire conversation around Venezuela is completely wrong. Now, I was in Venezuela, and I was actually there in 2015, at kind of the height of that crisis that they were having with the food crisis. I was there during the election that the opposition won control over the National Assembly. And I can tell you there, first of all, you know, yes, there were shortages of consumer goods. Uh, there were lines at drugstores and such. That was all happening. Uh, but I didn't see people starving. I didn't see people in, in desperate conditions of hunger. Number one, there were definitely problems there. But the United Nations has the same view. You know, the United Nations has come out and said there is no humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. But let's back up even further, because what exactly is going on there? Well, you'll remember you had Hugo Chavez, who was the president. He came to office in 1999, right? And then you had the September 11th attacks, and then you had uh, the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. He opposed it, and then there was an attempted military coup against him. Um, this military coup was beaten back, and he came out of this military coup a lot stronger. And then Hugo Chavez, he'd, he'd originally come to office on the platform of saying he believed in neither capitalism or socialism. He was for what he called the third way. And then he reversed himself and he said, you know what, I believe in what he called 21st century socialism or socialism for the 21st century, depends on how you translate it. And so from there, Hugo Chavez changed the way the government run oil company in Venezuela works. Now the government run oil company in Venezuela was just kind of a middleman for Wall Street companies beforehand, basically. Exxon Mobil, BP, Chevron, these companies would just kind of use the government run oil company as a middleman. Well, Chavez changed that. So all of the revenue from the government-run oil company started pouring into the government budget. And, you know, keep in mind, this is how Venezuela's economy has been for almost half a century. It's basically been centered around oil. Um, it's been an oil state. And Chavez changed it so the Venezuelan public and the government would start getting the revenue from their oil sales. And with the oil money, Hugo Chavez then started building up the government, uh, building up the government's uh, structure. He started bringing in uh, literacy volunteers from Cuba. They wiped out illiteracy in the country. Uh, they started setting up free health care clinics where these Cuban doctors would provide people with medical care. And so all over the country, people got medical care. They actually had a program uh, where uh, it was actually named after the individual in the Bible who was healed by Jesus, uh, who was blind. Uh, because a lot of people in Venezuela are blind, and if they had s access to a simple medical procedure, a simple eye surgery, they wouldn't be blind. So all over the country, uh, they started curing people who were blind because of poverty, and they, they started curing them. Um, it was a huge breakthrough. And you'll have to remember at this time, the oil prices were dramatically rising, right? J Bush invaded Iraq. An oil-producing country in the Middle East was blown off the market. Uh, they put sanctions on Iran, so Iran's ability to export oil was, was limited. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the falling out between the USA and Russia, you had that, uh, that oil strike in Nigeria. And at this point, you had some of the highest, you know, by the end of the Bush years, you had some of the highest oil prices in the world. Um, uh, I mean, the ho highest oil prices in history. I mean, $110 a barrel at one point. These were high, high oil prices. And at that point, when you had those high oil prices, the Venezuelan government had lots and lots of money, and they were building up lots of infrastructure in Venezuela. Um, you know, I mean, it was Venezuela was doing very, very well. People were rising out of poverty. Um, and Hugo Chavez urged the public, he, he, he pushed for the idea that they needed to get out of this dependency on the international oil markets. Uh, they needed to have their own steel mills. They needed to have their own agriculture. Not very much farming goes on in Venezuela. They import a lot of their food. Almost all of their food is imported at this point. So these problems were happening, and Chavez was saying, look, we need to do it. And the economy was doing very, very well. And it wasn't really until 2014, after Hugo Chavez died from cancer, many people believe he was assassinated, many people in the Venezuelan government believe he was assassinated, uh, but after he died, right, you had the new president came in, Nicolas Maduro, so there was already starting to be a new level of division within the United Socialist Party. And then on top of that, um, you had the oil prices dramatically decrease. Under Barack Obama, all of a sudden the Saudis started churning all this oil onto the international markets. We already had a huge amount of oil because of hydraulic fracking. And all of a sudden, almost out of nowhere, these high oil prices, $110 a barrel, $119 a barrel, it shoots down to $40 a barrel, $30 a barrel. Things got bad, right? 2015, 2016, the oil prices were low. And as the oil prices were low, at that point, at that point, 
the government revenue in Venezuela drastically shrunk. And so Venezuela was already in a weak position being dependent on the oil. And then at that point, when the oil markets crashed, the oil markets went down because Saudi Arabia was flooding the international markets with oil. At that point, the Venezuelan government, which was already in kind of a, a point of political division with the United Socialist Party divided in the aftermath of the death of Hugo Chavez, when that happened, uh, you had division in Venezuela, and that fomented the political crisis. And I was there in 2015 during the presidential election. I talked to all kinds of people. I talked to people that were supporting Maduro. I talked to people that were opposing Maduro. And everyone there told me that they loved socialism. And that was the interesting thing. You know, the right wing in the USA, and everyone says that everyone in Venezuela hates socialism. No, the right wing, uh, uh, Enrique Capriles, he said he's a socialist too. He just wants to get along with the United States, and he's not an, uh, an extreme communist like Maduro. Everybody in Venezuela was telling me they liked socialism. But the Chavistas lost the election, and they called it a punishment vote. Uh, because at that point, uh, even though people liked the uh, liked Hugo Chavez, uh, they were frustrated with the way the Maduro government was handling things. They felt like there was corruption. And so based on that, there was kind of a punishment vote against the government. But nobody was saying that they loved capitalism. Now, if you think if Venezuela was, was all suffering because of socialism, all the right wing would have to do is say, oh, we want capitalism. We want capitalism back. And people would vote for them. But that's not the case. The opposition in Venezuela has, has and really, they've stopped that. During the early years of the Hugo Chavez government, uh, during the early years of Bolivarianism in Venezuela, that was the line that the Venezuelan opposition would run. They would say, look, you know, the, the, the Hugo Chavez is a communist. He wants this country to be poor like Cuba. Uh, and that line just didn't work. And in fact, in Latin America now, even the Pope is telling people he's a socialist, right? Socialism is everywhere. All the opposition, uh, you know, Henry Falcone, who ran against Maduro in the last recent election, he said he was a socialist. Everyone says they love socialism. Uh, no one is going to run with this idea that we want free market neoliberalism. People remember the 1990s in Latin America. People remember how awful it was in the early 90s in Latin America when, uh, when at that point, uh, you know, in Venezuela, the electricity would just go off for days because the government wouldn't have the budget to maintain the electricity. Um, you know, the, the garbage wouldn't be picked up and people would have to go on strike. No one in the neighborhood would go to work unless they started collecting the garbage. People would have to burn tires in the streets to get the electricity to come back on, to get the garbage. Public services were just not functioning because they were part of the IMF and they were getting IMF loans. And in order to get those IMF loans, they were told they had to cut their public sector. It was a nightmare when they, they drastically cut public transportation. And that's where Hugo Chavez came from, was in, you know, in 1992, after they had this huge cut in, in public, uh, public transportation costs. When that happened, the people of Venezuela in Caracas, there was a huge rebellion, just, just a wave of rioting. And after that, you had Chavez attempted coup, the Caracazo. Uh, when he attempted to take power um, in order to fix it. Um, Anti-imperialism says, get on the Jimmy Dore show. Well, hey, I would love to do that. Jimmy Dore is a great guy. Um, Libertas Aterna says, hey, Caleb, I'm late. Well, I was late too. We had an issue with, with this Wirecast thing. YouTube needs to get their driver software in order. But, but Venezuelan's problems are ultimately about the drop in the oil prices and about the fact that, that Venezuela has been positioned has been a, it's basically been positioned where it's dependent on the international oil markets. Now you'll notice Bolivia has a socialist government, right? Uh, Evo Morales, the movement towards socialism party. Evo Morales actually began his inauguration with a with a moment of silence in memory of Che Guevara. Bolivia is not having a big economic crisis. Um, that's just not happening. Uh, there's other, I mean, I was in Ecuador, I, I, I'll repeat myself, but it must be repeated. I was in Ecuador in 1999, when they were in the grip of free market neoliberalism in, in Ecuador, when they had just been forced to switch to the dollar by the International Monetary Fund and the World Trade Organization. I was there when Ecuador was a capitalist country. I was 12 years old. I got off the plane. I'd never seen so much hunger, so much starvation, so much misery. I went back to Ecuador in 2013 at the height of the Correa government when they were moving the country towards socialism. And I'll tell you, it was a different country. I saw highways that had been built. I saw, I, I mean, I saw, I didn't see homeless people at all, basically. I, I mean, I saw some, some folks that were selling cigarettes on the street uh, for cheap, but I don't know if they were homeless. I think they probably just had a home. They were just selling cigarettes to make some money. Um, I saw all kinds of new businesses that had opened up. You know, I, I saw all kinds of, you know, families that had cars and people had Chinese cell phones and Ecuador had been vastly turned around by socialism. 
And uh, so, you know, there, there's such distortion about this whole whole situation. You know, um, there's a piece, I know that Fox News did a piece called The Truth About Socialism, and they played that clip of the, the View argument with Joy Behar and McCain. And then after that, um, after that, you know, they, they go on this tirade and they say, name one place where socialism has ever worked. And it's like, hmm, hmm, what was the first country to conquer outer space? The Soviet Union. What was the country that played the biggest role in defeating Adolf Hitler? The Soviet Union. What country went from being, you know, having, you know, primitive, uh, you know, farming techniques with horse-drawn oxen to having, you know, a, a mighty industrial economy to producing more tractors than any other country in the world, more steel than any other country in the world, all while the rest of the world was having a Great Depression? That was the Soviet Union. And... Let's, let's not forget today, what's the second largest economy in the entire world? China, where they have five-year plans, where the Chinese Communist Party has a monopoly on political power, where the state-run, government-controlled steel industry produces half the steel in the entire world, where the government-controlled copper industry produces half of the copper in the entire world. What's the largest telecommunications manufacturing corporation in the world? That would be Huawei. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. But Huawei, which is a government-controlled corporation tied in with the People's Liberation Army of China. Right? Um, this notion that, that socialism has just failed everywhere in the world is completely absurd. Both Russia and China are what they are today because of socialism. And in fact, in the 1990s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, capitalism, they had open capitalism in Russia during the 1990s, and it destroyed the place. Uh, you know, 20 to 30 percent unemployment, half the farms shutting down, the factories closing down, mass misery, mass poverty. And then what did they do to fix it up? Did they just become even more capitalist? Did they try to be libertarians? No. Putin came in and he created two huge government-controlled oil, oil and a government-controlled natural gas company, two huge energy corporations controlled by the government. And at this point, Russia's economy has rebooted itself and Russia is booming. Their economy is strong once again because of government involvement, because they created two government-controlled super corporations and the economy is centered around them. So this notion that privatizing everything is the solution, that socialism has always failed, is just simply not the case. If, if socialism didn't work, China would still be one of the poorest countries in the world. Today, China is the second largest economy on Earth. If socialism didn't work, uh, Russia would still be in the dark ages with, you know, with, with, with farming, you know, with horse-drawn plows. Uh, if, that, if socialism didn't work, uh, the conditions in Africa would be the conditions that you saw in Russia and China. But that's not the case. Both Russia and China have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. The country has come together, taken control of their natural resources, taken control of the major centers of production, mobilized the population with five-year plans, and they've actually built a better life for their people. And that is just the reality. And I'm so tired of hearing this. You know, all these people will say things. The Soviet Union never produced anything. They produced more steel than any other country in the world during the 1930s. How can they say this with a straight face? How can they say this? Uh, you know, uh, the Soviet Union never produced anything. Well, are you kidding me? They produced more. I mean, it was it was the, the country was was I mean, industry in the Soviet Union when they built it up with the five year plans, they had this the largest hydroelectrical power plant in the entire world. It was in Ukraine. It was the Dnieper Dam. This was the largest hydroelectrical power plant in the entire world in the 1930s. Right? And, and you're telling me, you're telling me that socialism doesn't produce anything? They took an entire country that did not have running water, did not have electricity, had mass illiteracy. They taught the population to read. They, they gave everyone running water. They gave everyone electricity. They had universal employment. The standard of living in the Soviet Union during the, the 1930s rapidly increased. You went, people went from living in huts huts with with you know with animals and and just just you know living in these primitive peasant agrarian conditions to living in modern housing units uh, apartment buildings with running water and electricity they were producing some of the best movies that the world had ever seen sergey eisenstein they were producing some of the best music during that period you had shostakovich Right and and that that amazing you know music and and cutting edge in the arts and the sciences I mean the Soviet Union in the 1930s you saw the five year plans under the leadership of Stalin transforming a country that had just been probably the poorest country in Europe and transforming it into just a world powerhouse 
And you saw leaders of the West going over to the Soviet Union, the Roosevelt administration, going over there and studying the five-year plans as they, they developed the Works Progress Administration and eventually started building huge construction projects here like the Hoover Dam. Uh, you saw, you know, uh, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, two kind of, you know, uh, socialistic intellectuals in Britain writing a whole book, Soviet Communism, A New Civilization, studying it. Um, even like Benito Mussolini and raving anti-communists going over there and trying to figure out how did they do this? How was it possible that they could raise a country out of poverty? Everyone was in awe of what the Soviet Union was doing in the 1930s. And whenever you say this, then people want to change the subject, right? Oh, well, then, you know, with the gulags and the Moscow trials and all of that. I'm talking about economics here. I'm not, I'm not here to debate, you know, political policy. I'm not here to debate whether or not this policy was good or that policy was good. I'm talking about economics. This conversation begins with people telling you the Soviet Union didn't produce anything. And that's a bunch of malarkey. That's just a bunch of malarkey. And, and I don't know how anyone can believe this. It's just factually inaccurate. You know, there's a term of lying through omission. Because if you open any, like, history textbook, right, They'll mention this in passing. They'll be like, well, you know, the Soviet Union was able to, you know, you know, bring water, water and electricity to everybody. But, but then there was this big famine in 1931, and they had gulags, and let's focus on that. And there'll be 100 pages on gulags, and they'll ignore the fact that an entire country was drastically transformed, illiteracy wiped out, huge leaps in the standard of living. They ignore all of that, right? And, and then people just make these statements like, oh, you know, uh, you know, the Soviet Union, you know, they never produced anything. Are you kidding me? How can anyone say this, right? Or, or then you'll get tr people that try to say, well, China, the, way, the reason that China is wealthy today is because it's capitalist, because they have capitalism. Really? Uh, uh, you think China is capitalist? Why don't you tell that to the millionaires who've gotten the death penalty in China? Um, why don't you tell that to all the college students in China who are required to take courses in Marxism-Leninism as the ideology? Why don't you tell that to the, the scientists and the engineers and the consultants that come together every year and write out a five-year plan of development? Why don't you tell that to the people in private corporations in China that get phone calls from the Communist Party that tell them you can do this and you can't do that and you must do this. You're going to build this building here. You're going to build that hospital here. Tell the, I mean, the notion that China is a free market country is absurd. There are a lot of private companies, but those private companies obey the state. They do what the Chinese Communist Party tells them to, and that's not capitalism. Capitalism is a system in which profits are in command. The rule of the dollar, hands off, laissez-faire. Socialism is when the people of a country come together and force the economy to work in the interests of the people. And that's what China has done. They've done it differently, right? They no longer do it in the Soviet way where everything's run by the government. But at the end of the day, the government determines all economic activity. In China, it happens if the government wants it to happen. And if the government does not want it to happen, it does not happen. That is a reality. Anyone who's over, been over there uh, will tell you that. And they'll probably tell it to you like it's a bad thing. Uh, but that's the reality. And that's why China is now such a large, powerful country, right? Um, and to be fair, you know, in the 1950s, uh, as their standard of living was first rising, they also, at that point, they didn't have a full Soviet-style economy either. Uh, you know, uh, during the 1950s, the period that they call, like, uh, new democracy in the country, there was a lot of private businesses. In the 1950s, there were actually a, a number of billionaires in China, actually. It wasn't until the 1960s that you got the hardline Soviet policies, and then, you know, with the Cultural Revolution and the Gang of Four, you got some pretty extreme stuff that was holding back the economy. Then Deng Xiaoping loosened things up, and and now President Xi is leading a crackdown on corruption. You know, the notion that China is capitalist is just just absurd. Um, you know, I mean, if you look at the way that, that China functions, you know, I, I got I to gotta say, I was just reading The Economist, right? The Economist. And these folks, this is the voice of neoliberalism right here. This is the voice of the London School of Economics. This is the voice of the people who believe in free market, unregulated capitalism, if you read The Economist. These, these are people who know who they are, they know what they believe in, and they love capitalism. And they do not love the Chinese Communist Party. And they do not love President Xi. This is not, this is not you know, some country where Wall Street can just do whatever it wants. Uh, China is a country where the Communist Party has a monopoly on political power. People who believe in Marxism and have studied Marx and Lenin and Mao and Deng Xiaoping theory up and down, backwards and forwards are running the country. They know what they're doing and they're rising. And this Belt and Road Initiative is brilliant, basically. They're going to go to developing countries and help them raise themselves up out of poverty. It's a good thing. But I see a lot of people have been talking at 
me here in the comments, and I've been rambling on and arguing against this anti-communism that I see everywhere that drives me up the wall, I'm going to get to some of your comments. Um, so, Pro Gun Tanky says, Stephen Kotkin is a conservative historian who says Stalin was a real communist um, and that the famine killed no more than five million. Well, I don't know about numbers. I can't talk about that. But actually, you know, one of the best books I've ever read about Stalin uh, was actually by a very conservative writer from Britain, Simon Seabag Montefiore. Um, and he wrote a book about Stalin called, uh, called Young Stalin. And he wrote another book called Court of the Red Czar. And both of those books, I think it's just because Simon Seabag Montefiore is, you know, he's an Oxford right-wing British conservative historian. He writes about Stalin and he says Stalin was, you know, he said he's going to be remembered like Napoleon was remembered, a great leader of a country. Um, he talks about the vast efforts that Stalin made to improve the standard of living in the country. Uh, and in his book, Young Stalin, he actually goes into detail about why it was that Stalin became the leader of the Soviet Communist Party. And it's very fascinating. Basically, uh, the Communist Party, or the Bolsheviks, they had like two ranks. You had a lot of working class folks who were kind of, you know, the foot soldiers. And then you had this, like, these kind of aristocratic, wealthy people who wrote all the books and gave all the speeches and did all the thinking. And that Stalin was kind of the middleman between those two groups. Stalin was from a very poor country. He was not a Russian, mind you. He was from Georgia. Um, and, and Stalin, you know, he was not a Russian. He was a Georgian. But his mother worked like crazy to send him to the seminary so that he could become a priest. And so Stalin learned to read and write, which put him ahead of like 65, 70 percent of the people living in Tsarist Russia at that point. He could read and write. And so Stalin could read and write, but he was from the peasant class and he was tough and he could, he robbed banks and he did this kind of militant street fighting stuff. And he was kind of the hero and the leader of these, you know, the rank and file foot soldiers of the Bolsheviks. But at the same time, he could give really good speeches, he could write really good articles, and he could also be an intellectual. And Stalin was kind of the middleman. You had, you know, Trotsky and Lenin and all these people in exile and, and you know, reading the books and, and writing all the theory. And then you had the rank and file, you know, Bolsheviks, the, the workers on the ground that are in the strikes and leading the protests and feeding people and running food programs and organizing workers' councils. Stalin was doing both, you know. Uh, they had a magazine, the Bolsheviks had a magazine called Iskra, which means spark uh, in Russian, Iskra. Um, that was like the theoretical magazine. But Stalin was the editor of an, a magazine called Pravda, which is truth. Um, and, you know, Pravda, unlike Iskra, which was like complicated Marxist ideology, the, the Pravda was actually, it was just letters. It was mainly letters. And people would write a letter to the editor, and they would write, you know, in my factory, my boss is driving me so hard. I mean, he just upped my shift. He lowered my pay. I can't take it anymore. And somebody else would write in and say, yeah, you know, in my factory, it, it, that, that Iskra, was a, it was a letters forum. It was a forum of letters to the editor, basically. And it was a place for Russian workers to express their views. And then there would be one or two articles with, like, kind of a basic introductory view view of Bolshevism. That was the Bolshevik newspaper, Pravda. And most of these factory workers couldn't read and write, so the way it would ha it would be distributed, and workers would read it to each other on the job. They'd be, you know, they'd be working on an assembly line or something, and one of them who knew how to read would be reading it out loud. And so the Pravda would, would describe the conditions in the factories. Um, it, it was something special. Stalin was an organizer. They tell a story. It's actually in Simon Seabag Montefiore's uh, biography, Young Stalin. He tells the story of, like, when a whole bunch of these Bolshevik leaders got exiled to Siberia. And they're all exiled to this rural village in Siberia. And they're all just sitting there, oh my god, what are we going to do? We're in the middle of nowhere. Oh my god, it's all awful. Meanwhile, Stalin goes to the local village. He makes friends with the local Siberian peasants. He even gets elected president of the hunting club. He is like a hero in the town. Everybody knows Stalin. He's entertaining them all with stories. He's recruiting them to the Bolshevik party. That's who Stalin was. Stalin was an organizer. He was kind of, you know, he, and you just see this. This is kind of the personality that you see in various leaders around the world. You know, if you look at Mao, if you look at Mao's personality, if you look at Fidel Castro, Hugo Chavez, there's a certain kind of personality that people like to see, and that, you know, the Bolsheviks, they were brilliant, the Bolshevik leaders, but ultimately it was Stalin was the organization man. He was the man who built the Bolshevik party, and that shows up later in his debates with Trotsky. Trotsky is saying, why don't we just, you know, draft all the workers into the military in the Soviet Union? We can just draft them in the military, their military service can be working in factories, it'll be a military economy. And Stalin says, no, 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 we cannot do that, we cannot do that. Um, it's fascinating stuff. Um, but anyhow, um, a lot to talk about here. Um, you know, there's a lot of McCarthyism on the left today. I want to say that much. You know, there's a lot of McCarthyism that's happening. 
And, you know, there's this notion that if you've been to Russia or you've associated with anyone in Russia, you're bad. You're no good. Um, and this is kind of scary. And if you look at it, you know, there's a there's a famous, um, you know, the McCarthy period. Let me back up. You know, I heard horror stories when I was, you know, when I was in communist groups. I heard horror stories from the older folks that would talk about McCarthyism, right? There's like a joke they used to tell about McCarthyism. There's a boss, right? And he calls in three of his co-workers. And he says to his, you know, three of these workers in his factory, he calls in these, these workers. He says to them, he says to them, I've heard that some of these people that work at this factory, that they're communists. He goes to the first guy, says, are you a communist? And the guy says, yep, I'm a communist. He says, you're fired. Get out of here. Calls in the next guy. He says, are you a communist? The guy says, yep. And he says, then you're fired. Get out of here. Third guy comes up. He says to him, are you a communist? And the guy says, oh, no, I'm an anti-communist. The boss says, you're fired. And he says, but I'm an anti-communist. He says, I don't care what kind of communist you are. Right? I mean, that was kind of how the atmosphere was, you know. Remember, I had a teacher um, who told me uh, he'd been, you know, his father had been a teamster, and he remembered that his father used to buy the Daily Worker uh, when he was a teamster. And I said, do you have any copies of it? He said, absolutely not. He would rip that up. And he said, you don't understand that back in those days, just to be seen with a newspaper like that was like you had something on somebody. It was like it was it was it was something you you didn't want to be seen with a communist publication. Just to be just to be seen as a communist was was something you didn't want to be. And these were were bad bad times. And the interesting thing uh, about about all of this is that we're in this weird period where it's like anyone who's associated with Russia, anyone who's been with, to Russia is no good. Um, but if you look at even during the McCarthy period the U.S. Communist Party really achieved some amazing things, just some amazing, utterly amazing things during that time period. For example, in 1948, uh, 1948 presidential election, because Harry Truman and the Democrats were full-on supporting McCarthyism, they'd actually gone as far as to start kicking out the, uh, the, the wing of the party, of the Democratic Party, that wasn't into McCarthyism. And so Henry Wallace, who was the editor of a progressive magazine, Henry Wallace, he, uh, he, from there, he, he runs for president on the progressive ticket against McCarthyism, wants to maintain the alliance with the Soviet Union. He's kind of keeping alive the Roosevelt wing of the Democratic Party. And when that happens, the Communist Party throws everything they've got into organizing Henry Wallace's 1948 presidential campaign. And if you look at, at that campaign, I mean, this was rather significant. I mean, it was millions of Americans who voted for Henry Wallace. The, and, and Henry Wallace was openly attacked for having meetings with the leaders of the Communist Party, for having communist staff, excuse me, communist staffers working on his campaign. And it didn't stop them all over the country. Um, and then it, it got to the point that a lot of African Americans in urban areas in the North who had the right to vote, unlike those in the South, a lot of them were voting for Henry Wallace because Henry Wallace ran on a platform. He was supporting civil rights. He was going to stop the Taft-Hartley anti-union law, and he was going to maintain friendship with the Soviet Union. And so a lot of African American ministers were going to vote for for Henry Wallace. So then Harry Truman, this you know this Democrat from Missouri who was at one point a member of the KKK, you know uh, he then. What does he do? What does Truman do? He integrates the U.S. armed forces, and he allows you know African Americans and whites to serve in the same divisions of the U.S. military. And so at that point, you get the Southern Democrats, the Dixiecrats, with Strom Thurmond. They break away from the Democratic Party, and they form the National States Rights Party, and they're supporting Jim Crow segregation. So the Democratic vote in 1948 was split three ways. Right? You had the Progressive Party, Henry Wallace, the Roosevelt Wing that wanted to you know, maintain you know, the, the alliance with the Soviet Union, supported civil rights, supported the labor movement. You had Harry Truman, and he was the president. He was running for re-election. And then you had the, you know, the KKK, national states' rights, Jim Crow segregationists. You had this th the split three ways in the Democratic Party. Now, there's a famous photograph that people like to hold up. It says, hey, uh, Dewey defeats Truman. Right, and it's got it's got a picture of, of Harry Truman smiling because he won, but all the news the newspaper says that the Republican Dewey won. Well, you know why the newspaper predicted that that Harry Truman would lose the election and that Dewey would win because the Democratic vote was split three different ways: Strom Thurmond from the South, Henry Wallace up in the North among the the progressives and the socialists, and the vote was split three ways. There was no way that that according to all the polls, no way Harry Truman could have won that election. But he did, and a lot of people look back on that election and say, hmm, something didn't really smell right there.
right? If you look at that election result, uh, you know, in Chicago, where, you know, the daily machine, this very, very corrupt political machine, uh, you know, Truman got a lot more votes than, than he should have. Uh, if you go to other parts, of the, other parts of the country, in the South, and most of the Southern states banned Henry Wallace from the ballot because he was, he was uh, in favor of, of ending segregation. So, so that election, the reason that, that Harry Truman famously holds up that newspaper that says that he lost when he actually won, and that's supposed to be so funny, uh, that was because the Democratic vote was split three ways, and it was mainly the intervention of the Communist Party in pushing Henry Wallace to run, in rallying people to support Henry Wallace, the socialist, that, that, that really ultimately had a huge impact on, on the U.S. public. And this is at a time that communists were being thrown in prison. I mean, at that point, you had the Smith Act trial of 1948, and the leaders of the Communist Party were all in jail. The FBI would follow people to their workplace. But even in the midst of all of that, the Communist Party in the United States was a very, very effective organization. They really got a lot done. Um, crazy, crazy times um, uh, that, that we've got going on here. Uh, what does Caleb Maupin think of Assange, asks Daniel Uko. I am very worried about Julian Assange, right? I mean, I mean that situation that he's going to be turned over, that Lenin Moreno is basically going to sell him out. Correa was supporting him and backing him. And, and, and if they prosecute him in the United States, I mean, that's, that's a big deal because Julian Assange doesn't work for the U.S. government, right? He's not Edward Snowden. He's not, you know, a whistleblower. He's a publisher, he, he, and he published documents that other people leaked. So if they prosecute Julian Assange in the United States, Julian Assange is not a U.S. citizen. If they prosecute him and, and, and are able to put him in prison, that creates a chill effect where, where basically people will be afraid and publications will be afraid to publish, publish the works of... Um, of whistleblowers. And so if somebody is a whistleblower, someone's in the government and they see some malfeasance, some bad activity going on, not only are they, I mean, whistleblowers go to prison all the time, but not only will whistleblowers go to prison, but now they're set, they would be setting a precedent in which anyone who publishes what a whistleblower publishes is in, da in danger. And that's a, a, a chilling situation. It would be a big threat to freedom of the press. You know, I mean, a lot of the, the malfeasance in Washington, D.C., the bad things that have gone on have happened because whistleblowers have revealed them. Whistleblowers have come forward and revealed what was going on. So if they are able to prosecute Julian Assange, I mean, it's bad enough. They've had him walled up inside of the Ecuadorian embassy in London for years. Um, this is this is a, a crazy, crazy time. And if they if they lock up Julian Assange, uh, that'll set a precedent. Um, that'll that'll you know they they're always talking about freedom of the press. Well, it's not freedom of the press if you get locked up for revealing uh, the crimes of government officials. Um, so that's that's what I got to say about that. Uh, I'm going to take another drink of diet soda here. Can't say the kind of soda. I don't want a product placement ad, but I am totally addicted to diet soda. You folks know that. Plenty to talk about here. What's going on? Someone says that they need a revitalization or a new effective labor party. Well, yes and no. See, the D and the R in the United States don't mean anything. Uh, for years, I kind of fell into this, right? I was mad at the Democrats, at the Democrats. Well, I wasn't mad at the Democrats. I was mad at the leadership of the Democratic Party and the policies they were putting out. But I would always say, oh, don't vote for the Democrats. Break with the Democrats. And then I remember in New York City, there's a member of city council, who I think he's now in the state general assembly, he's named Charles Barron, former Black Panther, militant anti-imperialist, defended, uh, you know, when at the time there was the bombing of Libya, he came out and, and you know, supported Gaddafi, uh, he's defended Robert Mugabe before, he, you know, is just one of the most, you know, revolutionary politicians ever, I mean, it's my honor to have, have met Charles Barron, right, and I, and so I remember when he was running for Congress, remember when that happened? I, I was supporting him as an activist. I wasn't a journalist at that point. I was an activist, and I remember supporting him. And I remember, you know, all these people saying, how can you support a Democrat? And I remember thinking, like, I'm not supporting the Democrats. I'm supporting Charles Barron. And the Democrats, Barack Obama, all the leadership of the Democratic Party poured everything they had into defeating Charles Barron, making sure he did not get the Democratic nomination. Um, and it ultimately went to someone else. Um, and but but you know you know when I was on the campaign trail, all these far leftists are saying, "How can you support a Democrat?" And I'm thinking, I'm not supporting a Democrat. I'm supporting a, a guy that all the Democrats hate. I'm supporting Charles Barron. I'm supporting a guy who is an anti-imperialist, a guy, I mean, and, and it was this weird moment where I realized that this, you know, and then I see now in, in, in uh, Ohio, we've got Bernie Kratz who are running on the Republican ticket. 
We've got Bernie Sanders Democrats who they, they're not going to get the Democratic nomination, so they run as Republicans, right? And, and then I remember that Karl Marx endorsed Republicans and that at the end of the day, this D and this R don't mean anything. You know, everyone knows. So, for example, right? in a one-party state, right, in a country where you have one party, right, uh, where you have a ruling party, right, like, you know, China, uh, you know, you have one, it's a one-party government, right? Everybody knows there's disagreements within the government. Not everyone agrees on everything, but there's one party. So if you want to have an influence in politics, you have, in China, you better join the Communist Party. Uh, in Syria, if you want to have an influence on politics, you better join the Ba'ath Party. I know that there's also the Communist Party, and there's the, the Syrian Social Nationalist Party, and there's other parties, but ultimately the Ba'ath Party is the, the, the ruling party. And, and so, but everybody knows that within the Syrian Ba'ath Socialist Party, there are differences. In the United States, we live, we don't have a one-party state. We've got a two-party state. But everybody knows that when you have a two-party state or a one-party state, those parties don't mean anything because people disagree with each other. They just naturally do. If you get people in a room, they don't agree with each other. And so when people disagree, they can have the same you know, letter next to their name and they still disagree. And I started to wonder, you know, what's the deal? And even the Republican Party, now the Republican Party began as a third party. But let's remember that the Republican Party was a split from another party major party. It was a two-party system. They were split from the Whig party. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, right, uh, the, the, the D and the R don't mean anything. Now, does that mean that I think we should always vote for the Democrats? No, absolutely not. I did not vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, um, I, you know, I didn't vote for Trump either, but I, you know, I'm not saying you should always vote for the Democrats. That's not what I'm saying at all, right? I, I voted third party pretty consistently throughout my life. Um, what I'm saying is, that, that the D and the R don't mean anything and that this, you know, break with the Democratic Party and all of that, it ultimately does not mean anything. And now somebody else is pointing out yet yeah, there's there's eight political parties in China, but the Communist Party is the right. And they're correct, right? In China you have like a peasants party, you have the left KMT party, and there there are other parties that are included in the government process, but ultimately the Chinese Communist Party dominates the process. And Everybody knows, however, that, that there are different views within the party. They march as one. It's a disciplined, revolutionary party, democratic centralism. But at the end of the day, no one's saying that just because you're in the party means that you absolutely 100% agree with everybody else. And that's the whole thing, is that within the Democratic Party, I mean, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and Hillary Clinton are in the same party, right? Does that mean that they're part of the same political force, right? Dennis Kucinich is in the Democratic Party. Uh, he was a member, he, he's still a Democrat. He runs in the Democratic primary, right? So Dennis Kucinich is in the same party as Joe Biden. Does that mean that they're exactly the same? It doesn't mean that. And that, that anybody can basically, anybody can basically be in any party. I could say I was a Republican tomorrow. I, I could probably, if I wanted to, I'm not a politician, I'm a journalist, but if I wanted to, I could go to the Republican, um, I could change my voter registration to Republican. I could go to my local Republican club. I could start volunteering in the local New York City Republican Party. I could even run in the Republican primary here in New York City if I wanted to. And I would lose because I'm sure that they don't agree with me on about a million things. But you know what? There, I could do it because it doesn't mean anything. You know, joining the Republican Party, joining the Democratic Party, it's not like joining the Communist Party. It's not like joining the Spartacist League, right? These are not cadre organizations. These are labels. These are loose affiliations of people who run for office. Um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, the two political parties in the United States, because they are so all-encompassing, and because if you're not part of them, you're not taken seriously, at the end of the day, they stop really meaning anything, because people disagree. Um, but anyhow, I'm going to take another drink of this beverage. Crazy times we've got going on here. All righty. Now, what's new? Now, I was talking about McCarthyism before. You know, there's all this talk about McCarthyism, and I, you know, Dalton Trumbo, and he, you know, he was the screenwriter. He wrote the movie Spartacus. Um, I, I don't know if folks have seen the movie Spartacus, right? It's a, it's from the early '60s, in 1960 and '61, um, and it, and it was, it's a, it's a movie, and it's, it's based on a novel. Um, and if you, wa the first time I watched Spartacus, you know, I had just seen the movie Braveheart. Um, I was a, it was a, you know, I was a kid and I had seen the movie Braveheart, like an edited version of it on television. It was very, very moved, very emotional film about martyrdom and sacrifice and rebellion. 
Um, so I remember I saw the movie Spartacus, like the 1960 early movie, uh, Kirk Douglas. I saw Spartacus, written by Dalton Trumbo. And I remember watching the movie Spartacus when I was young, when I was, you know, I was like, what, maybe, you know, I, I, don't know, I must have been like 11, maybe 12. I watched Spartacus. I hated it. I was just like, what is this? I didn't find it entertaining. I didn't get it. I was just... I just, I thought it was weird. Um, it lacked the emotions I liked. It was just, I didn't like Spartacus. Well, that's because I didn't understand it. And I watched Spartacus again, and then I read the novel uh, that it's based on. And I realized that this wasn't, this is not about, the, the, the book Spartacus, the movie Spartacus, is not actually about ancient Rome. It's not about the slave leader in ancient Rome who led an uprising. That's not what it's about. It's actually a political allegory for the Second World War, right? That's what the movie is really about. It's basically so there's a slave revolt in the Roman Empire, and so Rome becomes a military dictatorship, right? And at one point there's a scene where Crassus, the general who topples the Roman Republic, brings in the army. They have him with soldiers marching behind him, and he's supposed to look like Adolf Hitler. And it's supposed to be about the Roman Republic, which was, you know, you know, kind of sort of a democracy. You had people voting and such. The Roman Republic being abolished in the face of a slave revolt. And so then, the way that Spar as the slave revolt is crushed, the way that Spartacus is able to, to flee, the way that his son is able to flee, is through an alliance with these Romans, these wealthy Romans, who don't like who don't like Crassus. So it's it's an analogy for the popular front, right? This is, it, you know, the communists at that point, especially the novel, came out in the aftermath of the Second World War, right? We remember during the Second World War, you know, according to, you know, the common turn understanding of events, uh, basically Germany, Italy had become fascist in response to the Soviet Union, right? The Soviet Union had existed. It was a socialist alternative to capitalism. So these capitalist countries were shedding the veneer of democracy, and becoming fascist, right, in order to in order to maintain the rule of capital. In fear of a communist revolution spreading, Germany becomes fascist, Italy becomes fascist, fascism is spreading, right? So then what did the communists do? They formed the Popular Front or the People's Front, and they aligned with those anti-fascist capitalists to defeat the Nazis, right? And that's how, you know, ultimately Eastern Europe moved into, in, into socialism, and that's eventually led to the Chinese Revolution. And so really what, what the, the Spartacus novel and the film was about, it wasn't really about ancient Rome. It was about, um, it was really at the end of the day, it was about fascism, it was about the Popular Front, and it was about the Second World War. And that's what it was about. And I, I remember at the time reading William Z. Foster's book that he published uh, in the early 1950s, The Twilight of World Capitalism. And the first chapter is all about World War II and what happened. And, and I'm reading this and I'm like, aha. And so as you watch Kirk Douglas, um, you're, you're watching an analysis of the Popular Front that happened during the Second World War and the, the you know, and, and how fascists, um, fascism and the alliance against fascism by the communists took place. That's what you're watching. Um, and But the writer of the movie Spartacus was Dalton Trumbo. I don't know if folks remember Dalton Trumbo. They recently made a movie based on his life. Um, there was actually a Broadway play with the letters that he wrote his family when he was in prison. Dalton Trumbo was a Communist Party member. Um, he was an, an Italian-American uh, you know, from New York City, eventually moved to uh, California, became a screenwriter. He was a member of the Communist Party, and because he was a member of the Communist Party, he was blacklisted. And so, like, he wrote uh, an award-winning movie, uh, a movie for a very low-budget film company, and he wrote it under a fake name because he was blacklisted. It was called The Brave One. Uh, the Brave One. And he wrote this movie, and because, it, it, you know, it wasn't a very high-budget movie, but uh, and it was made in Mexico, very low-budget movie, and um, but he wrote it, and he won the Oscar for Best Screenplay. But then... He won the Oscar, and they announced that the Oscar goes to, and it was his fake name, and no one could go and claim his Oscar because, you know, he was not allowed to write. He was blacklisted for being a member of the Communist Party. Uh, very, very famous, uh, you know, uh, occurrence that happened, um, Dalton Trumbo. Um, and eventually, you know, the early 60s, what was special about that was that McCarthyism had kind of run its course. You know, uh, 1946, you had the beginning of McCarthyism, um, you know, uh, with the Cold War, with the Iron Curtain speech by uh, Winston Churchill. That was the beginning of McCarthyism. Uh, 48, you had the Communist Party of the United States basically being outlawed, uh, the Smith Act trial where the entire national board of the Communist Party is put on trial for, for, attempt, for, for teaching the necessity of the violent overthrow of the U.S. government. They're all put in prison. Um, you know, in 1951, you have the McCarran Internal Security Act that's passed. 
the McCarran Internal Security Act, it says in a, in a time of national emergency, uh, the government is going to assemble a list of up to 2 million people who will be put in concentration camps. Right? You can read about the McCarran Internal Security Act of 1951. Pretty crazy. Um, then, you know, as things escalate, then you have ultimately 1954, uh, you have the execution of the Rosenbergs in the aftermath of the death of Stalin. You have the entire international community basically rallying, you know, to free the Rosenbergs, saying the Rosenbergs are innocent. All these heads of state around the world saying that this should not happen. But the Rosenbergs get the death penalty. Stalin is dead. Khrushchev is, is in, in terms of rising, and at that point, McCarthyism started to ebb. And the reason that it started to ebb was basically Joe McCarthy and the John Bur well, they weren't the John Birch Society yet, they weren't founded yet, but these kind of anti-communist fanatics, a lot of these doctors and lawyers and people like that, they were using the fear of communism to exercise political power in the United States. Right? Joe McCarthy famously accused the U.S. Army of not being hard enough on communism. Right? And, and have these investigations of the U.S. Army. And that all kinds of mainstream politicians were terrified of Joe McCarthy. And that this, this kind of extreme wing of the Republican Party that didn't represent the richest and most powerful capitalists. It represented kind of low-level, middle-class folks via Joe McCarthy. They were exercising huge, huge amounts of political power. And everyone was terrified of them. And, and that was at the point where the Kennedy family, you know, the Kennedys, they had been all about McCarthyism. They loved McCarthyism. They were Roman Catholics in the urban political machine of Boston, and they saw the Reds, the, the communist labor organizers and all that, as their rivals, as their competitors, as a threat. They were all about McCarthyism. But, you know, mid-50s, they back away from it. And, you know, there is this fear um, among a lot of forces among the rich and powerful in the United States that, that McCarthyism was going to cause a blowback, uh, that basically people were going to be so put off by McCarthyism uh, that because of that, uh, they're going to be interested in communism. And you actually start to see some of this play out. For example, uh, have you ever watched the show The Twilight Zone? Uh, that was made during that period, the aftermath, when McCarthyism was kind of on its way out. And a lot of those episodes have themes about totalitarianism and how if you don't have free speech and if you suppress people for the way they talk, you're going to ultimately help the, the communists and the totalitarians. There's a movie, The Manchurian Candidate, which is like an anti-communist science fiction story. But in it, you know, it's the Chinese have brainwashed this, this congressman, and he, you know, when he went to Manchuria and he's been brainwashed. And, and but the way that when they, when the Chinese, the, the communists have brainwashed this congressman, they make him an extreme right winger. Um, so it's like to discredit the United States, and it's like McCarthyism is, is hurting us in our fight against communism. That became a really big theme, and you had a, a whole crew of people, you know, that were involved in the civil rights movement really took off. I mean, a lot of people, I mean, even up to the highest levels of the government, a lot of forces really felt that Jim Crow segregation was in a lot of ways discrediting the United States, uh, because remember when Emmett Till was lynched, the Soviet Union took that photograph they sent it all over the world, and they sent it to African countries, they sent it to South America, and they said, anyone who says the USA believes in democracy, look at this picture of this mutilated African-American teen who did nothing but, but allegedly whistle at a white woman, right? And, and that photograph, the, the, the photograph, it was really in Jet magazine, like an African-American magazine. The Soviet Union circulated it all over the world, and there were a lot of forces in the USA that felt like in order to, to fight communism, the USA needed to be more liberal. And that the more liberal the United States could be, that would be the way to defeat the communists. And so there, there was a surge of kind of liberal activism, and the, the Kennedy family gets involved with civil rights, and the Montgomery bus boycott, and all of this was happening, and McCarthyism was starting to play itself out. And, and the culmination of this kind of post-McCarthyism was the election of John F. Kennedy. And you'll remember that John F. Kennedy, you know, at the time the movie Spartacus came out, at that point... That, that Dalton Trumbo, this communist writer, had written the movie. It was very open. He said, I'm Dalton Trumbo. I wrote Spartacus. And they were showing it in the American theaters. And all over the country, the John Birch Society and these right-wing activist groups were picketing the movie. And you'll remember very famously, John F. Kennedy went to see the movie Spartacus. He went to see it. He said, you know what, I, I, you know, I, it's a good movie. He gave an interview. He said, it's a fine picture or something to that effect. And that was a big deal, and that was kind of McCarthyism being edged out. But, you know, Dalton Trumbo was this writer, and I must say, you know, as much as I, I, I now, as an adult, as someone who understands politics, and I get that the movie was about World War II, and it's a political message, and it's not Braveheart, now as, you know, as an adult, I like the movie Spartacus. I must say, as much as I liked the movie Spartacus, uh, and Kirk Douglas, and I love, love the politics there, 
Dalton Trumbo made a, did another thing that disappointed me. He made another movie during that time period. He made the movie Exodus, which is just an Israeli propaganda film. I mean, it's just really explicitly, blatantly an Israeli propaganda film. Exodus, right? And there's that song, this land is mine. You know, it's Spartacus, right? Um, and, and, or not Spartacus, it's Exodus. I guess he must have liked movies that ended in U.S. or O.S. I'm just kidding, just kidding. But no, but he made the movie, um, the movie Exodus, which was just an Israeli propaganda film. Um, and the movie Exodus, uh, interestingly though, as much as it was an Israeli propaganda film, let's not forget that the Communist Party of the United States, the Soviet Communist Party at that time, they were pro-Israel. They took pro-Israeli positions. It wasn't really until the 1967 war you saw that the Soviet Union, you know, explicitly turn, you know, against Israel. Um, and th there had been some falling outs. There was, you know, the doctor's plot. Um, there were there were various parts of Eastern Europe where they found Zionist uh, spies, Israeli agents, or allegedly Israeli agents. I don't I don't know the the details. And there was there was tension. But ultimately, you know, at at the time the movie Exodus came out, there was no contradiction between being a an open communist and a supporter of the Soviet Union and being a supporter of Israel. And so Dalton Trumbo, who made this great Hollywood you know Marxist film Spartacus, he also made a Marxist film uh, you know Exodus that was very very pro-Israel. So I can't fully endorse Dalton Trumbo there. Um, but uh, the other thing is, though, if you see his movie, The Brave One, uh, The Brave One, um, it's the movie that he won the Oscar for Best, best Screenplay for. Um, it's a really good movie. Um, it's, it's basically, it's about a bullfight, and it's about this, this boy who goes to rescue his pet bull from a bullfight, and it's really low budget, made in Mexico, um, but it's got all kinds of politics in it, um, political hints, like below the surface. They talk about the peasant condition. They talk about the Mexican Revolution. Uh, they talk about uh, Abraham Lincoln's alliance uh, with the, the people in Mexico uh, who wanted, uh, who, you know, who wanted uh, to, to, to fight for the peasantry and how Lincoln had opposed the Mexican-American War. Um, it's kind of below the surface. It's mainly like a children's movie about this little boy who's trying to rescue his pet bull. Um, and it's also, you know, it kind of hints at how bullfighting is about cruelty. And it's got a fascist edge to it. And why do people want to hurt other people? And it's kind of this human story about the little boy who wants to rescue his bull. But there's, there's, you know, communist politics beneath the surface, you know, in a way, you know, hinting at it. Um, but it's, you know, Communist Party USA at the time politics, right? I mean, it talks about Lincoln in a positive light. Oh my God, right? You can't do that now or else, you know, I mean, but, but, you know, I mean, it was, it was the line of, you know, that, that, that in Mexico, there had been the Mexican revolution, this uprising of the peasants. Los Indignados, you know, and that, uh, you know, and that that was in line with Abraham Lincoln opposing slavery and that there there is this resistance of the people and this human resistance to cruelty. It's a beautiful film. Uh, I'm glad it won the, the best screenplay because it's just a beautiful, beautiful film. Now, what's interesting about it is, you know, the film, you know, it's about bullfighting, basically, and it shows bullfighting in a very negative light. But it was pointed out to me by somebody that bullfighting, even though now, I mean, I'm opposed to bullfighting. Do not get me wrong. I am against bullfighting, cruelty to animals, barbaric behavior. I'm against it. But the origins of bullfighting, the origins of bullfighting are interesting if you look at the origins of bullfighting. Bullfighting as a tradition actually goes back, I bet you didn't know this, to Mesopotamia. And the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? Gilgamesh is this, this mythological hero considered the founder of Mesopotamia. And one of the actions of Gilgamesh is he killed a giant bull, right? Gilgamesh killed a giant bull all by himself. And it was to show the people that, look, this bull is bigger than I am. It's huge. The bull is huge. The bull is stronger than I am. The bull is bigger. But I, as a human being, possess human intelligence. So I, as a human, even though I'm weaker than the bull, even though I don't have huge horns, even though I'm not, you know, a hundred thousand pounds, I'm, even though I'm nowhere near as, as powerful as a creature, I can slay a bull because I have a soul, because I possess within me human intelligence. And in the Epic of Gilgamesh, you have this important scene where the founder of Mesopotamia, one of the first civilizations in human history, slays a bull to show his followers what it means to be human. 
And that the, that the bullfighting ritual, and later, you know, in ancient Rome, you have the Colosseums where they're killing animals, and, and that the bullfighting ritual originated in human beings trying to define what separated them from animals and why it is we could build a civilization. Very, very fascinating. So as much as I hate bullfighting, as much as I'm opposed to it, cruelty to animals, as much as I'm opposed to it, it's fascinating that it has this history and humans trying to define themselves and, and define their, their difference and to lay the basis for civilization. And what's also interesting is, is it's kind of a double-edged sword because, you know, the, the bullfighting is an act of cruelty. I mean, you're killing a creature there, but in the process you're defining. And so it's like civilization has always had an edge of, of cruelty. Um, um, Julian Drews asks me, hey, Caleb, your opinion of Jordan Peterson? He doesn't understand Marxism, but are there other points that you think he makes that are valid? Well, in all honesty, you know, I, I've watched a few of his videos. I will say, you know, they promote his videos like crazy. I mean, they come up in my news feed like something else. And I'm so tired of hearing his voice. I'll see a, uh, an item. It'll be, oh, it's Jordan Peterson talking, and I'll, I'll click on it, and then I'll hear him talking again. And, you know, a lot of it just sounds like traditional conservatism. Some of it, you know, seems... You know, but but the big thing about Jordan Peterson is he does not know anything about Marxism. If you, the second he starts talking about communism, the guy he says things that are unforgivable. He says that 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 Tsarist Russia was a paradise compared to what the Bolsheviks created. He says that in one of its videos. I don't know how anyone can say that with a straight face. There was no running water for most of the population in Tsarist Russia. There was no electricity for most of the population in Tsarist Russia. People were dying of malnutrition all the time. The, the vast increases that the Bolsheviks gave in the standard of living. Um, you look at how the arts flourished with Shostakovich, with Eisenstein. I don't know how anyone in their right mind, you can talk about bad things that went on in the Soviet Union. There's no need to romanticize it. There's no reason to deny that bad things happen. But, but for him to say that, that Tsarist Russia, where, you know, people were hanged, you know, they had floggings for the peasants for saying the wrong things, the, the nout or the knots or whatever, you know, they, I mean, you know, the amount of torture and degradation that went on, uh, the way people were, the conditions that people were living under, uh, under Tsarist Russia, where, you know, I mean, people basically had no human rights. You had the Stolopin reaction, these hangings where people were just being hanged on the suspicion that they might, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, Tsarist Russia, where, where, I mean, you know, the, 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 the level of economic development was just so, so low. Um, people couldn't read and write. They weren't being taught how to read and write. And he wants to tell you that somehow the czarist Russia with no notion of any human rights whatsoever, that that's a paradise compared to what the Bolsheviks built. How can anyone in their right mind get away with saying this, right? Uh, you know, uh, literacy, um, uh, literacy, uh, education. Uh, you know, women were going to college. I mean, they built universities all over the country, electricity, running water. I, I mean, come on. I don't know how he can say this. And then he's this great intellectual voice we're supposed to believe. Um, you know, I mean, the, basically the guys read one book about Soviet history. It's, it's, uh, it's the Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn, and he thinks he's an expert on the Soviet Union, even though, you know, Solzhenitsyn himself has a very mixed reputation. Solzhenitsyn, you know, in his diaries, he was always wanting the czar to come back. Uh, you know, uh, you know, there's all kinds of, of stuff there. So, you know, you know, I really, I really have a low opinion of of Jordan Peterson. I must say, not not the biggest fan. And if he can talk that way about communism, why should I believe anything else he says? Right. Um, the biggest problem is he equates postmodernism and the kind of university-based oppression theory with the entire history of communism. And the only reason he talks about communism. Very interesting. The only thing he ever talks about about communism is it's like, well, these people that are postmodernists on the universities with Hannah Arendt and George Orwell and all of that, well, they can all, Judith Butler, all of them, they can all be traced back to Marxism. They have all read Marx. They cite Marx. So therefore, you should never believe anything they said, all because Stalin killed millions of people. And the amount of ignorance in that statement, um, you know, the amount of like, I, I mean, he's, he must have been living under a rock. I mean, seriously, you must be living under a rock if that's what you think. No one should ever study Marx because of Stalin, right? And and that's just that's just a level of like he's basically announcing to the world, I don't know anything about what I'm talking about. I don't know anything about what I'm talking about. There's one clip where he's trying to explain Marx's theory of overproduction, and he gets it entirely, entirely wrong, and in just in a really embarrassing way. I mean, this guy should be embarrassed. He should never open his mouth about Marxism. Never, ever, ever should he ever open his mouth about socialism. Jordan Peterson does not know anything about Marxism. But the problem is, I'll never get to debate him. They'll always find lame 
liberal social democrats to argue with him, who, who their response is, he'll say the Soviet Union produced nothing, he'll say that everyone in the Soviet Union was poor and miserable and never anything good ever happened there, and the, and the response of those liberals, they won't challenge any of it, and they'll just say, well, that wasn't real socialism. I, and, and, and then he can butcher them and has this whole thing about, oh, see, you're so much of a narcissist. Do you think that, 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 that you can do better? Blah, blah. And it, it's, it's, it's a problem. Is the only response to, to the hard right is this liberalism. That's why the debate that I had with Augustus Sol Sol Invictus was so important. And that's why the views on it just keep piling up. I mean, they just, it's the thousands. People watch that debate. Julian Assange watched that debate. Sean Stone uh, of Watching the Hawks on RT recently promoted it in, in a recent conversation he had with a filmmaker. Uh, you know, that debate that I had with Augustus Invictus was very important because we never, you never get a real argument in response to the hard right. Uh, the, the argument is, well, that's not real socialism or, or don't worry. I mean, no one will, no one can actually defend the legacy. Um, but, you know, I want to speak frankly a little bit. I'm going to take another drink here. Um, you know, I want to speak frankly here for a moment because I think, you know, we need to be real. As much as I like to point out that, yes, the Soviet Union did have economic successes, I, I want to back up for a moment because I, I think there's some things that need to be said, okay? Read the history of the Russian Revolution. We cannot understand the conditions people were living in in 1917 in Russia, right? Uh, you know, all these people who are like, well, I'm a Trotskyist, right? The, so the Soviet Union was good, and then it became a dictatorship, but I'm a Trotskyist, right? Oh, I'm a Trotskyist, right? You get that. Or these people that are like, well, Lenin was good, but after him wasn't good, or, or the Bolshevik Revolution was originally good, and the Bolsheviks took it. All these people, okay, read some Soviet history. After the 1917 October Revolution, all over, you know, for the first week, we're talking like weeks after the revolution, there were all these drinking parties. People were celebrating, Right? And that became a problem because the White Army and the forces that wanted to overthrow the Bolsheviks were in massing and preparing to attack. And so the Bolsheviks confiscated all the alcohol. And then they implemented the death penalty for drinking alcohol. Right? The death penalty for drinking alcohol. Now, I'm not saying that they're bad for doing that because this was a military situation. They needed to get the population ready. They conscripted all the men. Uh, put guns in their hands, forced them to join the Red Army in order to fight the coming onslaught. And it happened. And the White Army came in there and they fought and lots of people died. But they conscripted all the men. You know, it was, you know, you join the military and you desert. If you desert, then you get the death penalty. And they, they shot people for drinking alcohol. And I'm not saying they were wrong to do that, okay? Because it was a military situation. When your country is, is facing a blockade, when, you know, I mean, when people are fighting, it's a kill or be killed situation. But I, I as a person, cannot ever imagine myself in a situation where I would shoot somebody for drinking alcohol. I just couldn't do it, right? Because I'm not in those circumstances. I'm not in a kill or be killed situation. I'm not facing, you know, I'm not looking death right in the face like people were in 1917 in Russia. And that that, that was a week after the revolution. That wasn't evil Stalin who did that, you know, you know, you Trotskyites, that wasn't evil Stalin who did that. That was Lenin. That was a week after the revolution that they're in a situation where people are getting the death penalty for drinking alcohol. That's how intense the military situation was, right? And that's what was going on. That was happening, right? And that that's why when people in the USA put on, you know, Red Army costumes and like to pretend that they're, you, know, you don't know what you're talking about. The conditions that the Bolsheviks were in, the conditions that Tsarist Russia was in, with World War I going on and millions of people dying, I, you we can't relate to that, right? In those circumstances, it would make sense. It would make sense in a military situation. It would make sense that you would institute the death penalty for drinking alcohol. That's not my point, is that they're evil for doing it. I'm just saying I cannot imagine those circumstances. And neither can you. Neither can you, right? This is something that we cannot relate to. And so, yes, the Soviet Union, in order to survive, in order to survive, became a very, very authoritarian place, right? And you had factions. They tried. They had three parties at first, right? At first you had the Bolshevik Party, and then you had the Left Menshevik Party, and the Left Socialist Revolutionary Party. All, all the parties, these three parties that supported the Bolshevik Revolution, they were all aligned, right? And they tried. And then pretty soon anyone who really, really supported the, the revolution joined the Bolsheviks, and then a member of the Left Socialist Revolutionary Party shot Lenin, Right? And the left Mensheviks were seizing government buildings and assassinating people. And, and pretty soon they outlawed those two other parties. 
And then you have Lenin coming forward and outlawing factions in the Bolshevik party and saying, look, if we're going to succeed in these situations, if we're going to succeed in these situations, we can't even have factions within our own party. You know, we, and he, they outlawed factions in the Bolshevik party. Right. And that's the Soviet Union was a very authoritarian place. It was a very authoritarian country. But that my point isn't that they were bad because of that. My point is because that's the circumstances that they were in. They were building socialism surrounded with 15 countries invading them with a blockade so they couldn't get medical care with all kinds of attacks. I mean, it was bad. Those years following the Russian Revolution were bad. And in that situation, in that situation, um, in that situation, we can't relate to what was going on there. We can't. We just can't. And we can't judge them for it. And we can't say to them that, oh my gosh, you didn't have the level of freedom that people have in New York City, in Brooklyn in, in 2018. Oh, you're bad. No, we can't. We can sit here and say, well, we would have done it this way. Well, if, if we had been there, we would have done it this way. And that's really nice to think, but we haven't been in those situations. I mean, people talk about, you know, they make all these allegations about millions of people dying. You know how many millions of people died in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution during the Russian Civil War when food wasn't being imported into the country? Those years immediately following the Russian Revolution were bad, bad years. And that's why the Trotskyists, that, that's one thing I don't get. You know, it's one thing to uphold Lenin and defend Lenin. You know, I've read Lenin's works. I've studied a lot of it. I've learned a lot from it. But, but to say that the Lenin years were good... And the Stalin years were bad. It really shows a disconnect, okay? The Lenin years, you know, those were some pretty, pretty bad times. That was a, a point where, you know, like the Quakers and uh, the Red Cross were going in there and delivering medicine, where people were starving and it was, it was a bad time. The economy in Russia started getting better. When Stalin came to power in 1928, when they established diplomatic relations with Western countries, and they had the five-year plans, and they mobilized the population to start building up a socialist planned economy in one country. And that's when you got, you know, hydroelectrical power plants being built. That's when you had illiteracy being wiped out. That's when you started building universities and schools, and the steel mills started churning out more steel than any other country in the world. And that's when, the, you know, the population that had been living in huts started living in modern housing units. That's when they, you know, the, the collective farm system, uh, they, they built it, and all of a sudden they had, you know, track and mechanized agriculture and factory farms and, and all of that. That's when things started, life started improving in the Soviet Union in 1928. And really it began improving with the five-year plans. And for Trotskyists to go, well, the books that were written, you know, while all these millions of people were starving to death and all of that, the books that were written were more pure. So I'm for the Lenin years, uh, you know, but I'm against Stalin. That That's just kind of crazy. And in Russia today, Stalin is very, very popular. And a lot of people who are not communists actually admire Stalin because of what he did for the country. Meanwhile, Lenin, you know, communists in Russia like Lenin. His, his body is still in the mausoleum. Communists like Lenin. But that's about it, you know, that the Lenin ain't too popular in Russia these days. He has a group of admirers. There are certain people who like him. There's a strong communist party in Russia that has a, you know, a, a solid base of support. Um, you know, I mean, Grudinin was the second place candidate in the elections. The communist party, they're a, a significant political party. But at the end of the day, Stalin is far more popular than Lenin is because Stalin's policies are associated with Russia becoming a strong country, with the standard of living rising, with defeating the Nazis during the Second World War, uh, with, you know, ultimately, you know, taking the measures that got them into outer space. And that, 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 you know, we can't, as people living in the first world, as people who haven't, you know, you know, gone through, you know, harsh military situations, we can't relate to what went on in the Soviet Union. You know, I cannot ever, ever imagine myself shooting somebody for drinking alcohol. I can't imagine ever doing it, but I haven't been in those dire circumstances. And that's the point, right? That, that, that we don't know what we're talking about. And when people say, oh my God, the, you know, the Soviet Union's an evil country. I heard somebody got arrested for reading a book. Well, you know, I, you don't know what they were up against. You really don't. I mean, read the, the situations that they were in. What the Soviet Union did when they got themselves from, from, from the darkest situations that they were in right after World War One, after the revolution, the fact that they got there to outer space. They got there, they defeated the Nazis, they built a modern country, they built a modern steel industry, they built, you know, I mean, they, they created a, a world superpower. The fact that they went from those dire circumstances after the revolution to where they got, to where they were by the 1950s and 60s, that shows that socialism works, that socialism did not fail, that socialism is a success. 
right? And that's what you need to learn from the Soviet experience. That's what I take from the Soviet experience, and I stop there. I don't judge. I don't know what I would have done in those circumstances. I really don't know. You know, the kind of choices the Bolshevik leaders had to make. I don't, I can't even relate to those choices. The kind of decisions that they had to make, you know, when they, you know, when, when they, I mean, we cannot relate. We really can't. I believe in socialism, and I think the Soviet Union, what they achieved, despite everything, and the same for China, what China has achieved, despite everything, shows that we don't have to have capitalism. But beyond that, you know, I beyond that, you know, step back, right? We don't know the situations we're in. Um, Landon Shuk, I don't know who you are, but you said hello. Well, hi to you, Landon, my best. Uh, John Doe says, farther left, farther right you go, the closer you get to it. I don't know what that means. Uh, I'm going to drink the last of my soda here. So much to talk about. Oh, boy. Um, but, yeah, you know, I mean, I was in Russia. I was there for their election. And, you know, a lot of Russians will say that life was better under the Soviet Union. They will. They will laugh about the corruption. Um, uh, they will. They will complain about some of the problems that they had and how they didn't have access to, to Western consumer goods. But a lot of them will say that living conditions were better under the Soviet Union. That there was guaranteed employment. Uh, that that you know that, that the standard of living uh, was higher for most of the population. Now now the Putin government has been able to improve conditions. They don't have neoliberalism. When people in Russia told me about the 1990s, they talked about. They said we weren't living then. We were just surviving. I mean, the conditions that existed in Russia during the 1990s were were a nightmare. That was free market capitalism. Um, so John Doe says, sorry, Caleb, I was talking to Tim. Well, good for you. Tim's a good guy. I, or is he? I don't know. I don't know who Tim is. I, I shouldn't endorse anybody. I don't know. I'm, I'm joking. I'm just kind of joking with you there, John Doe. Um, has Ch China turned to capitalism? Reflections on the transition from capitalism to socialism by Domenico Lacerdo, Tornado Nick recommends. Well, I don't think China's capitalist. Um, uh, uh, I, I really don't, and I, I just I don't I don't think that's correct. And I think that people that think that the only form of socialism that is socialism is that Soviet model is absurd. Now I do want to say I've switched to water now. I do want to say that that Denmark, Norway, Sweden these are capitalist countries, right? They have uh, a lot of social programs. They have a lot of government regulation. Um, they they provide their populations with a lot of social welfare programs. But they're ultimately capitalist countries. At the end of the day, you know, the means of production in these countries function according to profits. There's just a lot of government redistribution of wealth. And that redistribution of wealth happens under any system. Under any system, you have the redistribution of wealth. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter. Capitalist, socialist, there's going to be redistribution of wealth, right? I mean, the roads outside of this apartment are wealth that was redistributed from the taxpayers. Uh, you know, there's there's redistribution of wealth in the, form, in the form of farm subsidies to agribusiness. There's redistribution of the wealth in forms of the food stamp program, so low-income people can buy food, and that also sub, uh, subsidizes the food and agriculture business. Uh, there's there's redistribution of wealth in the term of, of bank bailouts, right? Uh, all kinds of redistribution of wealth goes on under any system. Now, some countries have like a more complete more more free market system other countries they have a huge amount of, of wealth redistribution but there's always redistribution of wealth that's not the difference between capitalism and socialism capitalism and socialism the difference between those two systems is under socialism the mechanisms for creating wealth the means of production the banks the factories the major centers of economic power are operated for the good of society that the state and society comes together and tells and dictates how the means of production function. That is the difference between capitalism and socialism. In Venezuela, I've been there, and you have a big market, right? You have a lot of private companies, right? In fact, that's some of their problems that they have is the fact that, that food imports, and they've got the food importing com companies that, that, that don't necessarily like the government. But at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, the government forces the economy to function in, in the way that the society wants. For example, in Venezuela, um, at this point, you know, the government has all the, the money coming in through the oil industry. And through that, they're able to subsidize businesses. And ultimately, the means of production in Venezuela function according to a central plan. The same for China. China, you have a lot of private businesses. But at the end of the day, everything goes on how the government wants it to go on. Government-controlled industries and banking systems and corporations, they, they, they control everything. And the government controls the means of production. Production doesn't go on for profit. It goes on according to what the state central plan says. Uh, the same for Vietnam. The same for Laos. 
uh, you know, uh, uh, the same I would say for for various countries around the world. Uh, you know that 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 you know Syria, for example, the Ba'ath Socialist Party controls the economy. Uh, the major centers of economic power are in the hands of the government, and the government controls the private sector. The private sector is subservient to a state central plan. That's what socialism is. It's a an, an economy controlled by society in which profits are not the basis for production. That's what socialism is. What a day! What a what a day this has been. I must say I am deeply frustrated with uh, this YouTube encoding software because we started way later than we should have. You know, earlier I was talking, I was speaking about about uh, the art in the Soviet Union. Maxim Gorky. This is a writer that you don't hear much about if you live in Western countries. He gets kind of dismissed, but in China people love this guy. In Russia people love this guy. I actually have probably the, the first novel that he wrote that's considered to be socialist realism. Um, and this, this is the novel uh, Mother by Maxim Gorky. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful novel uh, that, that Maxim Gorky wrote. Um, and it's about a group of revolutionaries living in Tsarist Russia. Just a beautiful, beautiful book, The Mother. Um, and if you read it, uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of a romantic story. Uh, you know, there's this woman uh, living in Tsarist Russia whose son moves to the city and becomes a revolutionary. Uh, beautiful story. And, and Maxim Gorky, you know, he went into exile. He was a Menshevik, actually. He went into exile uh, after the Bolsheviks came into power. And then during the Stalin years, he actually, you know, was able to go back to the Soviet Union. And he lived in the Soviet Union for the rest of his life. Maxim Gorky. And he's just one of the most beloved novelists. He was a famous novelist in Russia prior to the revolution. And then after the revolution, he, he was very, very well loved. Um, Norway has a bigger public sector than Venezuela, says anti-imperialism. Yes, uh, but you'll have to keep in mind anti-imperialism, that in Norway, the public sector simply functions for the benefit of the private corporations. Um, and Norway has a much bigger economy overall. But in Venezuela, the public sector has control and that the private sector is in subservience to the public sector, right? It's not about the size of government. For example, Saudi Arabia, the public sector in Saudi Arabia, I don't know if you want to call it the public sector, the royal sector. Saudi Arabia is huge. There's a huge amount of government ownership in Saudi Arabia. But all the government of Saudi Arabia does is ensure that the Saudi royal family can make profits. And the, the decisions that the government makes are for the purpose of making profits for the Saudi royal family. And uh, that's why they were churning oil out onto the international market while their economy was crashing and burning. That, that the post office, right? We have a public sector in the United States, the post office. Well, the post office is not socialism, mind you. The post office is necessary to maintain capital, right? Because a lot of businesses, they need to use mail, and they need that mail to be not tied to any individual business, right? That's why the U.S. Constitution mandates that the government maintain a postal service, because not only do private corporations and private businesses need there to be a postal service, they also need it to be neutral. They need it to be not tied into any corporation, not favor any corporation over others. And that's why, you know, there's this talk about Jeff Bezos and how Amazon is getting preferential treatment by the U.S. post office. Um, um, but, but yes, but, but socialism is when the means of production in a country function in the interests of society not in the interests of profits. It's when the state controls the means of production and the means of production do not function according to profits. That's what socialism ultimately is. Um, and that's, that's the difference. And that, you know, yeah, I mean, Singapore. Singapore has a, you know, it's very funny. People try to say Singapore is a great example of capitalism. Well, it is capitalist, but Singapore, these libertarians who bring it up, they ignore that in Singapore, the government has a very, very big role in the economy, huge amount of state involvement. But what does the state in Singapore do? The state in Singapore ultimately makes sure that the four ruling families enrich themselves and make money. Um, you know, and that's how it is in a lot of countries. Taiwan, right? Big government sector, but the government makes sure that the ruling capitalist families make money. Um, so at the end of the day, you can have a big public sector, and that's not the equivalent of socialism, right? Let's be very clear. Capitalism is an economy centered on profits. Socialism is an economy that serves public good. And that's the difference at the end of the day. You can have a socialist country with a big private sector. You can have a capitalist country with a small uh, public, with a small private sector and a big public sector. That's that's not the end of the day. This notion that socialism is the DMV um, and that capitalism is McDonald's or capitalism is your friend Joe the bar owner who just started his own business and why would you want to take that away from him? There's plenty of Joe the bar owners in Venezuela, plenty of Joe the bar owners in China. In fact, that's one of the strengths. Modern socialist governments, we're not talking about the Soviet model, we're talking about contemporary socialism. Modern socialist governments tend to subsidize small businesses. Actually, yes, that is correct. If you go to Vietnam, you go to China, you go to even Cuba today, 
one of the activities that the government carries out is it actually helps people to start their own businesses, right? Most socialist economists have realized that the government should run the steel industries, the government should run the healthcare facilities, the government should run the major centers of communication and electricity, but the government shouldn't run the hospital, or I'm sorry, the government shouldn't run the hotels, right? The government shouldn't run the hotels. The government shouldn't run the bars and the restaurants, right? And that you need a private sector. In order to have a flourishing economy, you need to have a private sector, but that private sector must be controlled. It must be subservient to the overall state general plan. The means of production should be forced to function for the good of society. But that doesn't mean that, that these, these means of production necessarily have to be government controlled or government owned, I should say. They should be controlled by the government, but they should not be owned necessarily by the government. And that's, that's the difference. Um, but anyhow, enough about that. Um, you know, uh, I like doing this. You know, there's about 50 of you on here now. It's been hovering around 50 the whole time. Um, and actually, you know, I wrote a book on this very topic. Um, you ought to read my book. Um, if you haven't read it already, it keeps selling. I got to tell you, every time I get on there, I see that there's another copy, another few copies sold. I mean, this is a popular book. It's, it's striking a chord, Getting Rich Without Capitalism. Getting Rich Without Capitalism, this book I wrote, there's been reviews of it on Fort Russ, uh, other people like it, and I talk about, you know, how, I, I have a chapter on here about socialist billionaires and how there will be billionaires in, in a socialist society, and, and that's not contrary to the principles of socialism. I talk about, you know, why it is that China has, has risen, and I have essays in here about, about natural gas and the natural gas markets. I have essays in here against Ayn Rand and how uh, the kind of psychopathic ideology uh, that's being promoted by, you know, Randian objectivists is playing a role in the mass shootings in the USA. This book has really struck a chord. Everyone who reads this book tells me, you blew my mind, Caleb. You don't sound like anyone else. You sound unique. You have an understanding of, of politics, geopolitics, and social that is unique. I mean, this book is really, I, I got to tell you, it's striking a chord. People are reading it. Uh, crazy times going on here. You know, in this book, I talk about Huey Long. Huey Long was a politician from Louisiana. And my whole life, people have said that Huey Long was a fascist. I've heard this. Huey Long was a fascist. If you look into Huey Long's life, Huey Long was not a fascist by any means. I mean, Huey Long, he began his political career fighting against the Ku Klux Klan, right? Um, in Louisiana politics. He, he, has, he had mentors who were in the Socialist Party. Um, he was elected to office, and he took action uh, to benefit the black community. The first black nurses were hired. The first black, uh, black uh, government employees in Louisiana were hired because of Huey Long. Huey Newton, the founder of the Black Panther Party, he's named after Huey Long. He was born in Louisiana, and Huey Newton's father was such an admirer of Huey Long, as was so much of the black community. In fact, in Huey Long's Share Our Wealth movement, when he formed a mass political movement to back him up, uh, there were actually African-American ministers who were leaders of the Share Our Wealth movement. Um, Huey Long, he led Louisiana. He, he provided so much, and he basically got to the point in Louisiana where the government had huge amounts of money and was controlling the economy. And Huey Long, you know, with the Share Our Wealth movement and all of that, he never called himself a socialist, right? And he had a debate with Norman Thomas, and he contrasted his Share Our Wealth program with Norman Thomas and the Socialist Party's vision. He never called himself a communist, but from Congress, he was opposing Standard Oil. He was challenging. He was basically an anti-imperialist, uh, fighting against U.S. military interventions around the world. He took efforts to improve the life of the African American community, share our wealth, share the wealth. He was using, you know, the government to control the economy of Louisiana, making huge strides. He built Louisiana State University. He built so many bridges and highways. He he wiped out illiteracy in the state of Louisiana. At that point, Louisiana, that was a U.S. state, huge amounts of poverty in the, you know, the, the rural south of Louisiana, the swamplands. He wiped out illiteracy in the state, um, and it was African Americans who largely were learning to read in, in many parts of the, the state. Um, and, you know, Huey Long is widely loved, and when they tried to topple him, uh, they compared him, the, the Ku Klux Klan and these other groups that tried to topple him, actually compared him to Abraham Lincoln and to the Northerners and to the, to the Union during the Civil War. I mean, everyone who attacked Huey Long was attacking him from the right. Um, and Huey Long, Huey Long was a progressive. And he, he was a, a socialist. He didn't call himself that, he, but he, his program was Share Our Wealth. He controlled the economy in Louisiana. 
That was dual power, if we've ever seen it, what Marxists like to call dual power. Look at the situation in Louisiana. You have to remember, in Louisiana, in the 1930s, he was in office from 1928 to 1935 when he was assassinated, the Communist Party really had no presence. So for him to announce that he was a communist would, would be kind of a, a silly thing to do. Uh, but Huey Long was ex exercising popular power. Now, PAB, I don't know who PAB is, P-A-B, is asking me, Caleb, do you, are you, do you call yourself a Marxist-Leninist? That's a tough question. Because because here's the thing. I study Marx and Lenin. I read Capital. I've studied Marx. I, I consider myself to be more of a true follower of the ideas of Marx and Lenin than most of the people running around saying they're Marxist-Leninists do. At the end of the day, however, if I were to say, get up and say I'm a Marxist-Leninist, that means to a lot of people they hear that and they think, oh, this guy wants to restore the Soviet Union. Well, the Soviet Union's never coming back, folks, and, and that kind of politics is not coming back. I study Marx and Lenin. I draw a lot from Marx and Lenin. I consider myself to be more understanding of Marx and Lenin's ideas than, than most of the people running around invoking them are. So do, do, am I still a Marxist-Leninist? I'm a Marxist and a Leninist in the same sense that I'm a Lincolnist, in the same sense that I'm a Rooseveltist, in the same sense that I'm a Chavista, in the same sense that I'm a Xi Jinpingist, in the same sense that I am a um, that I am a a Bothist, in the same sense that I am a um, a Christian socialist, I, I think we should study all of these leaders and we should understand all of their ideas. I, I tell people that I am a 21st century socialist and I am an anti-imperialist to my core and and I am a non-denominational. I don't I don't you know it was a silly thing. I remember you know these groups uh, you know these groups will uphold you know I remember when I was I was first getting into politics. I remember there were so many of these Marxists that I knew that the only revolutionaries they would support in any corner of the world were the the Communist Party of Nepal Maoist you know, because they were Maoist, right? And they would support the Communist Party of Nepal Maoist. And then I remember what happened. The Communist Party of Nepal Maoist, uh, there was the fight, they brought down the king, they entered a coalition government, they won. Prashanda became the leader. The Communist Party of Nepal Maoist won. And so what did all these communists do that said that they were the only ones they support? At that point, they denounced them. Oh, they sold out, they're traitors. It was just complete and utter silliness, right? And 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 that that was a moment that was kind of key for me. I think we should learn from all the forces around the world that have tried to build socialism, all the forces that are that are fighting against Western capitalism, fighting for for justice. We can learn from all of them. I think we should learn from all of them and blindly copy and and dogmatically obey none of them, right? Were Marx and Lenin wrong about some things? You betcha, right? Marx supported the British colonization of India. Did you know that? I bet you didn't know that. Marx said that Britain colonizing India was progress. That's what he said. And he said, yes, they're doing all these horrendous crimes and all that, but this is progress. They're going to bring capitalism to India. India will be able to, to industrialize and become a modern capitalist country. Well, that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. Right? What the British did was hold back development in India. They burned down the textile mills. They prevented India from industrializing. The British kept India in a state of chronic underdevelopment. So Marx, when he said that the British colonizing India was progressive, he was wrong. And when Marx said that, that the war with Mexico, when the USA seized Texas and, and Arizona and Southern California from Mexico, when that was a good thing, he was wrong. That was a war for slavery. That was a war to expand slavery and to expand the power of the slaveocracy in the United States. Lincoln was against it. Uh, um, all the progressives in the United States were against the, the Spanish-American War or the Mexican-American War. But Karl Marx, he thought it was right because Marx, there's another example of Marx being wrong. Right? And, and Marxists since then have denounced it. Lenin wrote a whole book, Imperialism, explaining about how Karl Marx, basically his assessment of how the capitalist market related to the rest of the world, how capitalism in Europe functioned, that it was wrong. Right? Marx said that all nationalism was inherently reactionary, that anyone who fights for their nation is, is a reactionary. And then towards the end of his life, even Marx says Marx was wrong. He says, look, the Irish people, he writes, they're fighting for their independence, not on the basis of workerism, not on the basis of, of class struggle. They're saying that as Irish people, they were right to fight for their liberation. And you know what? J Jenny Marx, Karl Marx's daughter, actually started wearing a crucifix around her neck because the way the British were justifying their atrocities against the Irish people, my people, the way that the British were justifying it was in the name of anti-Catholicism. 
right? That they were persecuting the people of Ireland, saying, well, these people are Catholic, therefore they don't deserve to have human rights. So Karl Marx's daughter started wearing a crucifix around her neck, the symbol of the Roman Catholic Church, because Marx realized that his position, that all nationalism was inherently reactionary, was wrong, right? Marx was wrong. That Lenin, in some ways, you could argue that Lenin was wrong. Lenin believed, he, he, Lenin still held on to this vision uh, that somehow the, 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 the Marxist revolutions were going to come from Europe, right? In his book, Imperialism, he says the revolutionary energy is going to come from the developed countries. But in the final years of his life, he's still thinking like, you know, well, this is going to spread to Germany, right? He still thought that that, that, that Europe was, was going to be the basis of the revolution, right? He did not predict to what extremes his, his, his observations about labor aristocracy and social democracy and the stratification of the Western working class, he didn't, he didn't realize how extreme this was going to be. So in some ways, Lenin was wrong. Um, you know, that, that nobody, this isn't, you know, no one is perfect. None of these people. And the second that you'd start talking about politics like religion, and the second that you start dogmatically following any of these leaders, that's when you start leaving reality. You know, I, I know a lot of folks from Albania, right? And they'll tell you that life was, was better under Enver Hoxha than it is now. They'll say that, look, under Enver Hoxha, everyone had a job, uh, you know, uh, people were taken care of, you know, but, but in the 1980s, you know, first, Enver Hoxha, he was the only, Albania under Enver Hoxha cut off relations with the Soviet Union and was aligned with China, right? And then in 1978-79, Albania denounced China. And Albania declared that this country, with like three million people in it, was the only socialist country in the entire world. All the other countries, because their leaders were revisionist and had somehow strayed from the holy word of Karl Marx, all of these countries in every other corner of the world were all somehow not truly socialist. And Albania, this tiny little country in Eastern Europe, was the one truly socialist country on earth, right? I mean, I mean, that's kind of what, when you start talking about politics like it's religion, that's what that leads to, right? Albania didn't have economic relations with very much of the rest of the world. And, and that's ultimately why socialism in Albania didn't survive. Right? It held on. It was holding on longer than most of the other Eastern European countries because they didn't have the liberal liberalization, right? They weren't they weren't, you know, having the liberalization. But ultimately the Communist Party of Albania, the Albanian Party of Labor, was toppled at the end of the day because, you know, because their socialism was stagnant. It was frozen, it was dogmatic, and ultimately it couldn't survive. So after Enverhoja's death, and after, I mean, they didn't have any, I mean, the final years, the economic policies they had in the final years, they had cut themselves off from the rest of the world. I learned a lot from reading the history of the Party of Labor of Albania. It's a very good book, and you learn a lot about tactics and how they were able to turn the Nazi invasion of Albania. They were able to basically turn that into a revolution, that at the time of the, of the Nazi invasion of Albania, at that time, the Communist Party of Albania was like 30 people. And by the end of the war, they had taken power and how they had utilized, you know, the popular front and they had polarized the country and mobilized. They were always one step ahead of the liberals that were fighting the Nazis. Uh, they were always one step ahead of them, always taking the struggle in a higher level. You can learn a lot from Enver Hoxha. And I'm, I'm telling you that I'm, I'm criticizing Albania, but I'm also saying that I learned a lot from it. Right? That Enver Hoxha was a brilliant military tactician and that the Labor Party of Albania, they, threw, they were able to basically turn the Nazi invasion of a feudal country because they had the Zog, the king, uh, you know, who was the, the Zog, and that was his title. They had a king. It was a feudal country, half Muslim, half Christian, and they were able to turn that into a revolution with a, with a party of like 30 people. And next thing you know, they're, they're leading the country by the time the Nazis are fleeing, right? I mean, that, that shows a level of tactical brilliance. So there's stuff to, that you can learn from Enver Hoxha. We should learn from Enver Hoxha. But at the end of the day, this notion that only Albania was the one true socialist country in the world, that's the, the logic. That's what comes from this notion of revisionism and purity and that anyone who doesn't follow my line is a pure sellout and a phony. It leads to this dogmatic, uh, this dogmatic blindness. Uh, now, uh, K-Y-L-E, um, I don't know if your name is Kyle or if it looks like Kentucky, Lexington, or K-Y-L-E says, can you make an audiobook? That's a very good idea. I very well may do that. I, I, am, I also like to listen to things. I read nonfiction, but especially if I'm going to read a fiction book. If I'm going to read a fiction book, I have to, it has to be an audiobook. It just doesn't hold my attention. I read nonfiction all the time. Um, so, Caleb, don't you think communism 
should be a future to strive for, says PAB. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is where it gets interesting, right? Because this is the problem. When people ask you about communism, the conversation always goes to, wait a second, how could the Soviet Union be communist? Because I thought in communism there are no classes whatsoever. I thought in communism there's no government whatsoever. And that's where it starts to get weird, right? You have to understand Marx's concept of communism in the context of world history. So Marx says that history began with hunter-gatherers, and then the means of production advanced. People got too good at their hunting and gathering, and so they advanced to feudalism and slavery. And then feudalism and slavery advanced, and we got to capitalism. And then ultimately capitalism, the contradictions within it, will lead to socialism, a higher stage. And Marx then predicts that socialism will lead to the higher stage, the higher stage of communism. And what Marx is writing about is basically he's arguing that after like thousands of years of socialism, that, that technology will advance so far that there will be so much material abundance in the world. He's predicting, right? This is, this is purely conjecture. There will be so much material abundance in the world that the need for any coercion will fade away. That's, that's what Marx is saying. He's basically saying that, that once we, we unleash the means of production from, from the irrationality of capitalism, once we can just keep advancing technology as much as we want, once human intelligence is so broadly released that, that we can get to the point where there will be such a comfortable life and that people will have to do so little, that the amount of human labor that's required will be so minimal, um, that, that we'll get to the point that, that there will be no need for any real coercion. That's what Marx is arguing. And I think he may be right. I'm not going to be here thousands of years from now. Well, maybe I will be, right? You never know. Maybe transhumanism and all of that, but I kind of doubt it. I kind of doubt I'll be here thousands of years from now. I think the chances are pretty slim to none, but you never know, right? You know. But, uh, but regardless, you know, Marx is arguing that, that eventually human history uh, will advance so far that, that we will get to a society with so much material abundance that the need for any coercion will fade away and that people can just kind of take what they need and do what they feel like doing, right? And it's this, such a high stage of civilization and that the way we live now, like he says that the way people look at slavery as a barbaric practice of humans owning other humans, the people will look at the private ownership of land the same way. Communism, the Marxist vision of communism, not talking about socialism, not what the Soviet Union had, not what China had, um, you know, I'm talking about communism. That vision that Marx had of, of an ideal that's like thousands and thousands and thousands of years in the future, right? Uh, a world without any oppression and coercion, right? That ultimately is, human, is humanity moving in that direction in the long term I would think so, yes, but let's keep in mind it's thousands of years in the future, and that's why it gets a little touchy, because people think that when you say communism, people think the Soviet Union was communist. People think that, that, that China today is communist, and it gets really confusing, and so it becomes a very confusing point of conversation, but the communist ideal, the communist horizon, the, you know, this stuff, you know, this is purely in the realm of philosophy. Um, but he's basically arguing that just like during hunter-gatherer times, people lived in tribes and there weren't really any classes in these tribes. And people, you know, you know, because the you know society, the the way, the extreme scarcity uh, of society during that period uh, was at the point that there were no classes. Marx is arguing that that basically, you know, that humanity will once again return to that, and that the class struggle and the development of the productive forces will ultimately lead to a, a level of production so advanced that you don't need any state or any form of coercion, and that people can just do what they want. That's what Marx is arguing. And so, sure, is that an ideal worth striving for? Sure. I think if we could get to a world where there's no coercion, no state, no need for prisons and all that, that's a, that would be a great ideal to strive for. We're nowhere near it. We are thousands and thousands of years away from that, um, but I think it's an ideal worth striving for. I think, sure, it's a good ideal worth striving for. So good question there, PAB or PAB or whatever your name is. Um, What else is new in the world today? Now, you'll notice that the oil prices are rising right now. Oil prices at this point are going up. We're at like about $80 a barrel. 
Uh, we were at seventy dollars a barrel, but it's starting to go up once again. And that you know, it's interesting. During the Bush years, the oil prices were very high. They remained very high during the first you know couple years of the Obama administration. Then after the bombing of Libya, once Libya was demolished and destroyed and taken out of the international oil markets, then you had the price drop. Um, 20, 2014, you had the real extreme price drop, and now and now under Trump, we see the oil prices rising once again. I think that's very interesting. You know, Trump gave interviews uh, to Fox Business about the oil prices. And when the oil prices were so high, uh, he gave an interview to Fox Business saying that basically back in the day you had a president who would call them up, who'd call up the cartel, call up the OPEC countries and tell them, you get that price down. Right? That's interesting. You know, the, the Trump administration basically admitted that there was government intervention to regulate the, the oil prices. This is long before Trump was even running for president. So that's kind of fascinating, I think. Um, uh, Tornado Nick says, frankly, no one knows what real communism looked like. What we should strive for is the improvement of global living standards and the equity within the guide philosophy. Well, that's, that's interesting, and that's ultimately the point, is that, that talking about communism is pretty silly. Um, you know, when, when Karl Marx wrote his 1848 uh, manuscripts, in those manuscripts, when he was talking about communism, uh, he basically he said it was, it, was, it, was, it was just kind of daydreaming. He wasn't talking about any concretes, you know. Somebody living in hunter-gatherer civilization in caves that are hunting and gathering and going around in tribes of 30 or 40, uh, those folks, you know, no matter how hard they daydreamed, I can guarantee you they can't imagine a life in Brooklyn, New York in 2018, all right? And us talking about communism is us talking about something that's so far beyond our grasp um, that, that I, I, I just think it's almost kind of silly. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I draw a lot from Marx and Lenin. I think Marx and Lenin were wrong about a lot of things. I think they were also right about a lot of things. And I think that that's how they should be looked at, as thinkers and people that are trying to make a better world, right? They were, they, were, they were people that were trying to make a better world. I mean, and Marx was an organizer and an activist, and that gets forgotten quite a bit. You know, Marx was key in the fight of solidarity against slavery. He was organizing textile workers in Britain to have wildcat strikes and refuse to work with cotton picked by slaves. He organized the, the International Working Men's Association, the first international, and that, that people think of Marx as just this pointy-headed intellectual. When Marx was young, uh, he was in the German Revolution of 1848, and he and Frederick Engels were running around the woods with muskets and guns like Che Guevara. I mean, Marx was an activist and an organizer, and his writing very much served uh, the purpose of um, uh, very much served the purpose of of guiding his activism. Um, and I think that, that that's something that gets lost. Um, uh, and uh, there you go. Um, but a lot a lot going on here, you know. Uh, all this debate about socialism in the United States, all these people saying, well, Venezuela had hardship in the last three years, um, and they put onto that, they've always had hardships, and then they put onto that, and that's all because of socialism. That's an absurd argument, and it drives me nuts. And then the response people have, well, Denmark and Sweden, oh, lordy. You know, the terms of discourse are, I mean, it's lost. The actual Marxist definition of socialism, socialism is when society controls the means of production. That definition is lost, and the understanding that society controlling the means of production has been successful at, at raising uh, the level of productive forces, that's also been lost. And the conversation is just drastically off course. Socialism does work. Socialism is the reason that Russia and China are superpowers today. It's the reason that all over the world people know about Cuba and that Cuban doctors and volunteers are all over the world, that Cuban, Cuba is teaching the world to read. Uh, socialism, socialism is is the reason that that China is you know leading the world in terms of high speed trains and computer technology. Socialism has been largely successful, um, and that's kind of left out of the conversation. Um, I want to say some other things here while while I'm at it. Um, you know, I I recently have been reading a lot of these memoirs. Um, you know, Outsiders Reverie. I just read this one, Outsiders Reverie by Leslie Evans. Um, and there's a lot of memoirs by people who used to be active socialists and communists coming out. And you read them all, um, and they all kind of end on a rather sour note. Um, you read them, they're all very kind of bitter. Um, these are, you know, former Trotskyists, former Maoists. They write their memoirs. There's something you can learn from all of them. They all kind of give you an insight into these various different communist groups. But they're all very, very depressing. Um, and 
it, it, you know, it, it's kind of insinuated, you know, the role of the government in infiltrating these groups cannot really be un, uh, underestimated. Um, and that, that, you know, that the way that these groups were acting over the course of the 1970s, you saw organizations of thousands deteriorate into organizations of a, a few hundred in, in a few short years, expelling everyone, driving everyone out. You know, I mean, the U.S. government has the, the job of making sure that, that, that there never is a revolution anywhere anywhere in the world, right? Um, that's basically, you know, the CIA, the Pentagon, that's what they do. They, they prevent communist revolutions anywhere in the world. They prevent any country from breaking out of the global system of monopoly capitalism. So it would really be foolish to think that, that they aren't doing everything possible to make sure that no leftist organization in the United States is not infiltrated, controlled, and that it never really gains a foothold. Right? And that the role of the government in controlling the organized political left in the United States should never be underestimated. And that, you know, these communist groups, you know, people think, why would the government waste its time trying to control them? Right? They got like 100 people, maybe 200 people at the most. You know, well, they, they, they want to make sure it stays that way. And that the conditions are ripe at this time for there to be some kind of mass leftist group. And so you can bet that they are working overtime to make sure that no level of opposition emerges in U.S. politics. And the other thing is um, that needs to be kept in mind, I think, is that you know right now Donald Trump is a populist. He's trying to be a Bonapartist. It's right wing. In a lot of ways, you know, there's a lot of bad things about it. What he's doing to immigrants is unacceptable. I didn't vote for Trump, but in some ways, you know, he's challenging the pro-war discourse. He's, you know, I, you know, there, I'm not completely negative on Trump. You know, I, I didn't vote for him, and I will not endorse him. I will not endorse his policies. But he's doing things. He's challenging capitalist power in ways that no one else has, and he's coming from the right. And I must say, there's a reason for that. If you look at the United States right now, it doesn't take a genius. You know, people were saying it to me before, and I kind of laughed them off. An old roommate I had, uh, who, uh, you know, he said to me, you know, you know, if there's going to be any challenge to the power of imperialism in the USA, at this point, at the beginning, it'll probably come from the right. And he's right about that. I'd say he, he was absolutely right. I mean, look, I mean, the right wing has a mass following in terms of, you know, you look at, at, at U.S. society, there is a mass base. These folks who were occupying uh, that, that bird watching building or whatever in Oregon and the Bundy Ranch and, you know, and the Montana Freeman and the sovereign citizens and movements like that have a much bigger base than any socialist or communist group does in the USA. Now, that's changing, right, with the rise of democratic socialists of America and, and you know, with the, you know, I mean, the discourse and a lot, millennials are much more open to socialist ideas, but, you know, since the 70s and 80s, up into the 90s, the right wing has a much bigger mass base, forces that, that are far right and are right wing in a way that the U.S. government won't tolerate. And that's the important thing, right? People that are just neoconservative Republicans are not a threat to the status quo. Uh, but, you know, and, and the people that are just kind of mainstream Democrats who maybe they think free health care is a good thing are not really a threat to the status quo either. But in terms of people that, that advocate things that are not in the interests of capitalism and imperialism, people who, who you know, want wanna the USA to pull out of the United Nations, right, because they think the UN is a conspiracy against the sovereignty of the U.S., it's global government, right? Those kind of forces, people who have right-wing ideas that are against the interests of American capital, they have a much bigger following at this time. Um, and it's changing, but a much bigger following at this time than people in the United States who are left and against the status quo have. Let's be real. And for a long time, a lot of leftists try to deny that those people are, are, are against the interests of the status quo. They try to say, oh, well, the government likes them because they're right wing. Well, no, I wouldn't be so sure of that. Uh, you know, I, there, there are people on the right that, that they're right wing. And they're not communists, and they're not going to, you know, you know, they're not going to change capitalist property relations. But the things that they advocate are things that would be very hard to swallow for a lot of American capitalism. And people, people, you know, they 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 lose track of that. I'm not defending the far right. Keep in mind, I'm not defending the far right. I'm just saying that that because the left in the USA is so weak, you know, a lot of the at this point, the challenge to the status quo in the USA is coming from the right for the most part. Um, and that, that to assume that just because people are right-wing that they can't challenge the status quo is a complete delusion. And furthermore, to assume that people are, are right-wing and, and that, that, that the government and the state only promote right-wing views is also delusional. John Brennan voted for the Communist Party USA in the 1976 presidential election. 
right? Uh, George Soros is not a figment of the right-wing imagination. He's a real guy, a billionaire who bankrolled color revolutions and anti-communist protests all through Eastern Europe. He's a liberal, right? Um, uh, you know, and I, from what I understand, Soros even, you know, supports Leonard Peltier, um, you know, and that, that, you know, that, that there is a left wing of imperialism, that there are, you know, people within the government status quo who have liberal ideas that are into yoga and mysticism and think that there should be national health care, right? That within the CIA, within the government apparatus, within, you know, the Rockefellers and the, and the DuPonts and the Carnegie's and the Vanderbilt's, there's a left face of imperialism. And that just because someone's left does not make them anti-imperialist, does not make them better than the right. And that, that, that there's this mess that people on the left, they get into this vacuum where people that are liberal are more their friends than people on the right are. And no one on the right could ever be against the status quo. And that's a delusion that people live under in left-wing circles, right? There is a liberal left social democratic face of imperialism. And there are people on the right whose right-wing ideas put them at odds with imperialism. And this is a reality that people need to recognize. Um, and and I, I'm not saying these right-wing forces are good. They're not good. And I don't agree with their ideas, but a lot of what they do think. I mean, for example, if the USA were to pull out of the United Nations, right? If, if some John Birch Society nut job took office and pulled the USA out of America, out of the United Nations, that would not be in the interest of a lot of big Wall Street corporations. A lot of Wall Street imperialists wouldn't like that. Let's be real. They wouldn't. I mean, that's just a reality. Um, and the fact that, you know, that, 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 you know, that there are, there is FBI infiltration of the far right and that there are, you know, I mean, look at Waco, look at a lot of this stuff. It's not as simple as people like to make it out to be. The ruling class are not one homogenous group that's sitting in the room plotting everything. There are factions among them. There are different interests among them. Um, and that, that, that capitalism, we're in a period where the, pro, the rate of profits are dropping and there's a lot of fighting among the ruling class and they don't agree with each other and they have different solutions about how to resolve the crisis. And the reason that the left is in a weak position today, and I'll say this, is in 2008, after the financial crisis, Obama was elected in a landslide and you know the cover of Newsweek said, we're all socialists now. And Michael Moore made this movie, Capitalism, a Love Story. And there was a section of the, of the ruling class of the United States, a section, not the majority, but a section, probably among the wealthier, like Warren Buffett. And they said, go get him, Tiger. That's what they said. They went to the left and said, go do it. Go, go, go out. They basically determined, a section of the American ruling class basically determined that in order to resolve the fallout from the financial crisis, they, we needed to move toward a more social democratic model. In fact, the Council on Foreign Relations even published an issue, the social democratic future of the United States. And they basically determined, look, to, to bail our way out of the crisis, we need to, you know, increase the level of, of social spending. And so they said to the, you know, the far left groups, they said, go get them. Go get them, Tiger. Go do it. And it was embarrassed. And the left fell on its face. Right? They, the left fell on its face. Right? That, that you know, it, it was a disaster. It was a disaster. Uh, the far left was, was given the opportunity to be a vehicle, to be a tool for sections of big capital that wanted to resolve the crisis with social democracy. And the far left fell on its face. Wisconsin. Do you remember Wisconsin? Uh, do you remember, you know, I mean, the Republic window and door makers strike. That was a good thing. I mean, I was there. I, I, we, I remember me and my college roommates got in a, a van and we, or a, a car and we drove to Chicago to support the Republic window and door makers. But at the end of the day, the, the far left fell on its face. Occupy Wall Street was not even by the far left. Uh, the far left didn't even do it. It was like New Forces, Adbusters Magazine and all that. It was like the far left didn't even do it because the far left was so weak. And that the far left, they had their chance and they didn't pull it off. Um, and, and that just has to be said. And so the far right kind of picked up the energy. And that's happened in Europe too. And, that, you know, this happened all throughout Europe, right? In the aftermath of Greece, you know, the Communist Party and Syriza. And then in a lot of ways... The far left, in the aftermath of the Cold War, with all this cultural leftism that, that they've absorbed, with this kind of anti-populist message, in the, the financial crisis, the, when the economy crashed, and, and when that happened, the far left was given, there was a section of the ruling elite that told them to go out and do it, and they failed. And so sections of the ruling elite that are closer to the far right 
Uh, you know, I mean, this is this is the problem that we're in. Now, things are changing. You'll notice that DSA, out of nowhere, DSA has kind of risen to become more powerful, Jacobin Magazine. And, you know, there's a section of American capital that is trying to do this Warren Buffett liberal social democratic solution once again. But, but you know, we're living in the aftermath of the failure of the left, the failure of the left to utilize the financial crisis of 2008-2009. Right, the the fact that the that the organized political left, the socialist and communist groups, didn't know what to do when a section of the ruling class was was telling them to unleash themselves, um, you know that that has to be said. That has to be said, and that 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 now there is utter confusion because basically the entity that calls itself the left was pulled apart over the course of the 20, 20th century. That that you know that, that within the left you have populism and anti-populism. You have this section that wants chaos and revolution and destruction, a section that wants order and stability, and that both of them were together and that they were pulled apart. Um, and that basically now the forces that want order and stability and populism, you know, around the world have become more right wing, and the forces on the left that want chaos and destruction and protest have become co-opted tools of imperialism. Um, and that, that, that and, and it's very complicated, right? And so the entity known as left during the 20th century no longer is is homogenous, and it's basically been pulled apart. And so now, you know, governments around the world that are anti-imperialist and are fighting to build up planned economies tend to be more conservative as defenders of order and stability. Meanwhile, forces around the world that want revolution and want to battle against injustice and behead every last king, most of them are aligned with imperialism right now. Um, and so it's it's a complete mess. Um, and we're we're living in a strange period. I'm working on a book right now. I'm working on a book right now. Um, I'm not going to say too much about it, but most of the writing that I do, like, you know, the, the Getting Rich Without Capitalism and all of that, these are just kind of essays that I've written, but I'm working on a book right now um, that, that will kind of, you know, talk about all of this uh, in a way that, that no one else is really talking about this, because I feel like we're at a weird political turning point. Uh, the entity that called itself the left throughout the 20th century no longer really exists. And we're in a weird political moment, and that there are some key points of clarification that need to be made. And I'm working on a book. Uh, I don't want to say too much about it, but it'll be a new book, and I'm hoping. Uh, I mean, it'll be it'll be interesting. I don't usually write this way. I usually write articles and essays, but this is going to be something completely different. I've written a lot of it already, but you know, I'm doing a lot of revisions, and it's it's kind of a, a long-term project. But if you're interested in socialism, uh, what I come up with will definitely surprise you will definitely surprise you because we are in a period where none of the old rules seem to make any sense. The political compass is broken. No one can tell which way is left, which way is right. Um, we're in a state of political confusion, and I don't think we have to be. I think there's a potential for things to drastically change. So on that note, I am going to conclude. Uh, I wish you all a happy Sunday afternoon. Uh, I, I apologize once again for the delay. I'm angry at at, at uh, at YouTube for this encoding software that made it so hard for me to start, but all is going well, and at least we didn't have a false start this time, so that's something, right? Um, I wish you all the best uh, until next week. I think I'll probably do one next week. Cheerio, um, but in the meantime, I need you all. Let me just point that out. I really need you all. You know, I can't do this alone. I'm one guy. I, I'm a reporter. I, I do my journalism. I write my articles. I write my essays, but I need you all. I need you all to tweet this stuff out. I need you all to engage with me. Maybe you don't agree with me. Maybe there's a video I made that you don't agree with me. Post it and say, I think Caleb is totally wrong here. Post it and get your friends to post about it and tell me what I'm wrong. We need to expand this conversation. This conversation that we're having here cannot just be 50 people on YouTube Live once a week. It needs to be thousands of people ultimately, right? There needs to be a much broader conversation happening. I need you. I need you to help me expand the terms of discourse, get this conversation going, uh, expand this audience, expand this debate. We have an important conversation going on here about the future of our planet, about the future of the human race, about the future of the world, about how we can get beyond this economy centered around profits. I need you. You need, you need me. I need you. We're in this together. We're a team. So I thank you very much for everything. And until next week, the struggle continues. Remember what this fist salute means, that even if the Walmart guy uses it, that's not what it means. Remember the fist salute. Remember what it means. You and me, we're in this together, comrades, brothers, fighting for justice. Until next week.